It's all part of the experience wearing the oh headphones. Nice. Oh my God, this yeah. is ASMR. <laughs> Cloudy. Yeah. Oh, this is so fun. Also, I don't hear all that well, so this is really, really wonderful. Oh, good. Okay. Shall we begin? Yes. I'll do a bit of a formal beginning. Well, you've seen the podcast, so it's not yes. that formal. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Start. Cloudy, mm. cloudy Optum Camp. As you sip on your iced coffee, yes. How are you doing? I'm well, thanks. Good. You? Yeah, thanks yeah, for great. Inviting me. This is so fun. I'm, I'm really, uh, pleased. Like how this came about, and it was just so serendipitous. You spoke to Benji, and you were like, "Oh, yeah, let's do," you know. Yeah, that's right. Um, Benji is one of your students. Mm. We should probably, yeah, clarify that. Yes, sorry. <laughs> yeah, <coughs> great student, by the way. As oh, well. he's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, where should we begin? Should we begin at the start? Wow. No, let's talk about um, what you've done recently, because that's like big headline news, isn't it, really? With the, the library stuff. Yeah. I always, when, when you say that line, let's start at the <laughs> very beginning, you didn't say it like that, but it immediately Sound of Music is in my head, which is one of my, <laughs> it's actually the first film I ever saw in the cinema, so it's always Sound of Music is a big theme in Oh, mm-hmm. nice. So it is kind of the beginning for you, in a sense. Yes. That, that film. Oh, God, yeah. I don't think I've ever seen it. Wow. Am I allowed to say that? Yes, of course. <laughs> I, I think I can dream it forwards, backwards. Yeah. No, I, I think I could probably say big chunks of dialogue from the film. <laughs> yeah. Go on, then. No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> um, so you are credited as having discovered, is it fair to say discovered? Uh, the first ever copyrighted motion picture. Yeah, I I would actually use the word identify. Okay. Because I think that that's a crucial difference mm. and that immediately goes to the heart of everything that I'm interested in researching because it says something about archives, right? Um, so I like to think of archives as places where um, things are being stored, uh, but discovering has this ring to it as if well maybe we didn't know where it was because you see how immediately this becomes very complicated because Mm. discovering (coughs) something says much more about where uh where we are in our lives looking at these historic sorry at these historic documents as opposed to how they ended up there, how they are being disseminated. Do you see what I mean? So discovering is a word which is, uh, uh, d- to me, problematic and Indiana Jonesy and you yeah. Know, um, <laughs> so identifying by triangulating all sorts of other information, that's, I think, what I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you think discover- the word discovering is more for something that's genuinely been lost, whereas this, I think something in an archive, you probably couldn't, could argue, was never really lost. It was just uh, not talked about for a while, maybe, or something like that. Yes, and, but we also have so much stuff. So mm-hmm. if, you know, the, the, the particular institution we're talking about, the Library of Congress, is the largest library in the world. Uh, 175 million items in their collection. Every day it wow. grows with 20,000 more. It is, it is really unfathomable, like how much stuff that is. Uh, but it, of course, it's also not everything that was ever made. Right, because that's an unlivable world. So this process of how does it end up there, and you know, there are so many layers to what we keep and what purpose and why and how and so yeah. So the the library is 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 documents, or is it also physical things? Yeah, it's it's everything. It's both physical and now you know increasingly more digital, of course. Um, but it's also, and I don't know if you know that, but originally uh, the, the US Copyright Office and the Library of Congress, they're, well, one and the same institution. So uh, materials come into the library because of copyright deposit, which is a system that is unique to uh, the US. Um, and so there is all this, all these layers of, complication when you think about um you know things coming into the library because of 
copyright deposit, it's maybe not necessarily something that you would want to collect, but you have to collect because they become federal documents. Because okay. that is the that is the actual location where you deposit the materials. What can you, can you think of an example of what you mean when something you don't want to collect but you have to collect? What do, what do you mean by that? Well, say I mean uh, a library is is different in that sense than uh, an archive, for instance, because uh, say uh, a film archive. So I used to work at the Netherlands Film Museum. Um, I think maybe and I definitely did so as well maybe people think like oh the National Film Archive of the Netherlands certainly keeps everything that has ever been uh, made and that's that's just you know philosophically that's not even possible but it's also in practice not the case it is a highly curated collection mm -hmm. right so certain things you do choose to keep and others you do not Whereas, right, that's more like a museum collection. Whereas the, the Library of Congress, because of that copyright stipulation, you uh, you just keep, right, you take everything in that. Things that are not necessarily of public interest, is, it, is what you're saying? Or, yeah, or, 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 or museal interest mm. or, you okay. know, whatever. So uh, if we do talk about that first uh, emotion picture, I mean, that was that was deposited as very much uh, a, a targeted, right? It, it, it's a way of trying to own it. It's not necessarily, oh, I want this to be part of the Library of Congress. I want this to be part of the film archive mm. that they're going to have found in, in the 40s. Um, so it is kept for different reasons. Mm. Can you explain what the first film was? The, f the first? Well... <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, I mean, I'm now gonna, uh, I'm expanding the, the project and hopefully it's gonna become a book um, in, you know, as I'm, as I'm thinking through some of these issues. But all of those words that you just said, I, I would put in quotation marks because what is the first film, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So I think depending on how you would define any of those words, what is a film? Right. Uh, <laughs> what is the first? So it kind of depends on how you demarcate, right, and how how you define it. So in this case, it is only retrospectively that we have decided this is where motion pictures start for the copyright office, right? Yeah. Because moving pictures existed for several years already then and it's it's still very very difficult to say what is what is the first there are some highlights on the way to still photographs becoming motion pictures um but in this case we have retrospectively decided this this is the the first one so um and it's a paper print right Yes. So actually, um, yeah, my own my own chapter in, in the book, uh, this this is sort of how I started the how I started that research. I've always known. So my background is in film restoration and through work, I would often visit the um, the silent uh, the silent film festival in, in northern Italy. And I remember even in the early 2000s that uh, you know, I was very new into that world, and you would everybody would be in this beautiful uh, uh, cinema, but people would walk out, and there was one bar where everybody would sit and hang out, and you would always hear people coming out of the cinema going, like, "Oh, that must have been a paper print. That looked so grey." And I kind of, you know, it, the, the the comments sort of lodged themselves in your head, and I maybe at the time I didn't necessarily know what that meant. And then as I started knowing more about them, I kind of only knew them as as the motion pictures that they were. Uh, but also later, uh, which is which is my main interest, the reuse of existing material. So the avant-garde filmmakers that that then started reusing these paper prints that early, uh, those early 20 years of American cinema. Um, and then via a different route, I sort of became interested in copyright. Um, and then the two sort of merged nice. because these films 
right, survive because of the idea that they were deposited for copyright. And when once I started thinking about them in terms of, um, well, legal documents, that becomes this, I don't know, it, it just opened up this whole fascinating world of like now everything, everything that I'm interested in is together in this one object. Mm. Uh, and I study photography as well, so they're technically photographs, but they're also motion pictures, but there are these legal documents, and then <laughs> later they become reused by these avant-garde filmmakers, and I have a huge interest in found footage filmmaking. So <laughs> I was like, w w I have to, I have to research It all this. merged together nicely. Yes. Um, what is a paper print? And what's the opposite, if you like, not opposite, that's the wrong word, but what what's, what's different from a paper print to say shooting on film or whatever is that is that the you know can you explain what paper print is yes so actually i mean uh, uh, there are some images actually the one on the cover there in the pink uh, in the pink uh, yeah so that's a for those watching on youtube that, that's actually a, a what you see there is a roll of film as right. we might still know it from the analog era but what you what you see there is not a roll of celluloid but it's uh, it's it's paper so it's opaque you can't see through it and it is a print from the the negative um in order to then store that at the library of congress deposit it for copyright so that your film is registered but because the film was shot on nitrate uh, also, you wouldn't send a negative, uh, right? A, a valuable camera negative to to the Library of Congress. But even imagine that that would be a positive. You wouldn't send that because the nitrate was inflammable, and you know, um, so the the library didn't have any uh, facilities, of course, to to store that. So they they thought of this ingenious way of um, of depositing it like that. However these beautiful rolls and they vary in size because films over time become longer mm. um the very first well the the five that i study which is kind of nuts right that out of all these 20 years i just look at the <laughs> the, the first five which only <laughs> comprise like a year and a half mm. uh, but there was sort of a transitional period <clears throat> from say 1893 to 1912 in 1912 the law changed in the u.s where so beforehand motion pictures could not be registered in their own category motion pictures as a copyright category didn't exist yet that is exactly why they were deposited as long strips of consecutive photographs they were registered as photographs mm. and um so you see this transitional period where lots of producers and filmmakers they interpreted the law themselves and you see all these experiments some people would send in two images of every scene in a film. Uh, some people uh, send in one enlarged frame uh, of every scene. Um, you know, there's lots of different ways and it's, it's beautiful to see because that's, that's actually where you see that uh, motion pictures start to emerge, right? They, they start thinking about, is it, is it an extension of what already existed, photography, or is this something new? And those 20 years or so are that uh, a transitional period. Mm -hmm. And those first, so paper print actually is a print on paper. I mean, it's as, uh, as straightforward <laughs> as that. Uh, it, it can take that form in a, in a film role, mm -hmm. but those very uh, first five, they are, and there's an image in the book, uh, it's, it's one flat photograph but the photograph consists of multiple other photographs, mm. if, all the frames of the film, if you wish. But yeah. they have been carefully, um, you know, re-photographed because you actually have to do something to the film strip, maybe cut it. We don't necessarily uh, know how the negative became this uh, a paper print. That it's, it's something I think probably we take for granted these days with the digitization of everything, how easy it would be just to, you know, lay things oh out on gosh. a page like that. Yes. But yeah, to mm. try and imagine how they did that and not mm. destroy the film. Uh, that's, the, that's exactly right. Um, but also the steps that are involved to get from this to that is, is that that's actually what I'm looking at now and where the idea for that might have, might have come from. Um, 
And it's fascinating mm. because there are so many steps involved in re-photographing because I've been fortunate enough to see the two deposits. So you had to deposit everything in two best edition copies. It wasn't just one copy. You had to deposit everything twice. And I've been fortunate enough to see the two sneezes, as they're called. That's That was what we, until now, thought was well, we didn't think it was the first that was registered, but it was the the first one that survived, which mm. technically is the, the, the second one. <laughs> um, and I've been fortunate enough to see them next to each other. Um, and it's, it's, it's astonishing because you just see one layer of emulsion. It's not, right? I mean, it has been re-photographed several times in order to end up at this one thing that got deposited. And... Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm just really fascinated by that level of tinkering, and they were they were changing, you know. And the and the uh, is it fair to say foresight at that point in time to understand how important it was to do this, or did they already get a sense that things needed to be copyrighted at that early stage? What do you mean they needed? Um, I mean, <clears throat> presumably before before the first motion picture was copyrighted, there were motion pictures produced or mm -hmm. artifacts of some description mm -hmm. before copyright mm -hmm. was a thing at all mm -hmm. that people just created and had no idea yes. that the importance of copyright and intellectual yeah. property yeah absolutely so do, do you feel like that was foresight at that time to be able to see that or was it an emerging problem that needed to be resolved yeah this is i mean this is a million dollar question right now there is so much still to discover about i mean if only i could fly back in time and sit down with W. K. L. Dixie and go like tell me everything. I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> now, the, um, so I liked on that note by the way, I liked the way the style of your um your contribution oh, to this no, book. No, no, the chapter. It was, you know, written to um to Ainsworth Rance Buffer. Right. Yeah. Who was um, the copy? Who was the librarian of Congress? Okay, thank yeah. you. And, and <laughs> I don't want to get my technicalities. No, but he was also he was also the head. Of, <coughs> the copyright office wasn't founded yet. That took another uh, four years. But he was the head of copyright, mm. and it's it's fascinating. He wasn't a lawyer, and he was you know determining. He sort of fell into that role a bit, right? Um, no, I mean he he kind of created it. Oh, okay, because he's the person who's responsible for bringing copyright to the Library of Congress. So before uh, that happened, he's been there for, you know, he, he in total works there for 47 years. So the stamp that he puts on that institution is, is um, you know, incredible. Mm. Um, but what happened before is that if you are an author and you, you would deposit your two books with your local district court, which no matter where you lived, right, in the U.S., and um, eventually that had to w make its way to DC, which of course it, you know, uh, often didn't. And so he thought of this genius way of centralizing that because he uh, in turn didn't have a lot of money to make the collection grow. So what he did was, why don't we have people send those two copies to Washington directly you sort of circumvent that extra step that also is a, right, uh, it, it puts a break on that development of, of uh, right, having the, the stuff come to In terms Washington. of n not having to seek things yourself, is that what you mean? Or Well, also, you know, the, the I, I don't know exactly how it would work, but I assume all the district courts were responsible for then sending it on to Washington, which, mm. it, you know, we, we have uh, we have the information that it, it, it didn't or it, it didn't always. And um, what am I trying to say? So what he did, he centralized it in D.C. So you would send your two books to the Library of Congress immediately. One would be for the deposit of the copyright and the other one would be to grow the collection. Oh. And so that was that was the genius. <laughs> I was uh, wondering why you had to send two. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the and reason. That was, uh, no, no. The reason <clears throat> was also you had to send two best edition uh, copies. I think maybe one didn't prove enough. I actually, yeah, it's a very good question. I don't know why. Because now, actually, only four or five years ago, the law changed that it's now one again oh, per um, perhaps this is because maybe you might have uh, stolen from someone one but it's unlikely you'd steal two or something maybe I mean I'm sure that there's a yeah <laughs> there, there might be a very practical uh, uh, answer to that yeah. uh, but he 
thought of that right genius intervention and then um, that's still the underpinning of the Library of Congress now 130 years later um, sorry but we came from a different direction like why why um, you said did they have the foresight and were they doing that uh, this is like I said the million dollar question because what I'm looking at right now is um, the, this parallel story between Mybridge, who worked for Stanford, and um, Dixon, who worked for Edison, and they're doing sort of similar things on either side of this breaking point, as I sort of say it, uh, or, or that's how I see it. These two are right before it, and these two are right, um, right after it, uh, around this breaking point of when we see the emergence of motion pictures. Um, but there's a really interesting uh, thing once you delve into their stories. These guys were really well versed in patent law because that's what they were doing. They were registering their machines, they were inventing lots of things. But there are different rules involved when it comes to patent as uh, when it comes to, to copyright. So we have some sort of indications that maybe they were thinking that the film strips that were coming out of the machine could be protected under the patent of the machine as sort of a uh, right as a as a consequence of the <laughs> of the technology a proof that the machine works in this manner or something that kind of <laughs> whatever they were thinking mm. um maybe it was yeah indeed a proof of the of the machinery rather than um maybe a creative mm. work in itself. Mm. So there is some indication that they were thinking along those lines, but it also has to do with um, attribution for who does what. Because in, in patent law, uh, uh, the so say Stanford and Mybridge, for instance, although Stanford was the patron, he paid for everything. Um, he, as a as a company, could not have taken out the patent. The patent always has to be in the name of the inventor. So um, in this case, it it's it's in the name of Mybridge, right? This this setup. Can I keep? keep you can move it away if you need to. It's fine. No, I think no, I might adjust mine slightly. Just, actually, just like just it's usually me I kicking just... kicking the the foot of one of them, but I've I've oh, changed right. how they're set up this time around. Anyway, sorry, we digress. Um, no, no. Um, <laughs> But in in copyright, it doesn't it doesn't work like that, right? Um, so what we see is some confusion around who owns what and who gets credit for what, mm. and this is very much I think uh, of our interest in this in the time in which we're living, sort of revising some of these historical narratives. Um, and not necessarily righting the wrongs, because I think you just talk yourself into a difficult corner when you when you look at history <laughs> like that. But it is obviously more complex. Uh, the story of invention and innovation is so complex. It's not just one person who does something, right? Times are times are ripe with ideas, mm. and they pop up in different uh, in in different places at the same time um, so what you see around that time is a sort of thinking that is slightly maybe confused with the thinking around pattern or at least that's what I'm trying to figure out right now but at the same time you see that Dixon particularly but also Mybridge they are registering their work for copyright uh, with the Librarian of Congress. So Dixon has been doing that for several years um, with his still photographs because he's the main photographer at, at the Edison plant. Right. And he's registering things that in a way he should not be registering. So if we were to do that today, you, could, you couldn't register that. You wouldn't be considered the author. So for instance, he registers a photograph of Edison as a 13-year-old boy. And if you think through that, Dixon has not taken that photograph. That was impossible. <laughs> but it also wasn't, it wasn't taken by Edison either. We might not even know who took it. But Edison <laughs> let Dixon 
register that photograph in his name. Now, that wouldn't happen now. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, so they're trying to figure <coughs> this out. Mm. But what's wonderful is that Dixon is asking all these questions uh, of Spofford, right? Spofford sets the policy, and he's writing him all these questions. And I've been able to look at all these uh, letters. And it's really, really fascinating to see that conversation you know, play out. <laughs> there is like a portrait of Edison's mother, which none of them owned, but Dixon is registering that in his name. There's a, a $40 bill with, no, actually that's that's different because um, a $40 bill, I, I don't know how, if they were rare at the time, but Edison has signed it and then he <laughs> copyrights that, right? It's just... <laughs> They're trying to copyright. It's like they're probing the system to see to see I, how it's going to end up or something. For sure. And uh, uh, Edison, um, we, I think... This is the Thomas Edison, by the way, isn't the it? The Thomas yes. Edison. <laughs> yes, it's it. Thomas Alva Edison. Um, so, what was I trying to say? Um that was a that was a the, nicely the timed was. sound effect. Yes, yes. I'm going to do that too. Mm. <clears throat> no, I think they're trying to copyright so many things. And actually, mm. um, this this was really wonderful when I was at the library because the manuscript division has this. Um, I, I sort of call it a mini collection of uh, thirty odd boxes of what we now consider to be. Um, the, uh, the unfinished business of the, the Copyright Office. So imagine that if you are trying to register something and it gets uh, rejected uh, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. then it gets sent back to you. And so there are, uh, is no record of the stuff that didn't get registered. And mm -hmm. that's really, really difficult as, a, as an insight when, you, <laughs> when you're trying to look at this history. So these boxes are full of stuff that didn't make it through or at least how have they collected these boxes then how have they have they just asked for people to bring stuff in or no, things have been no no at the time right so mm. this is just stuff that sort of sat like uh, this is too complicated for now oh, we don't know what sort to of do left it. it to one side it's almost the to-do list that never got round to absolutely it. no mm. it's a really good way of looking at it and the, the boxes also look at look like that it's just sort of haphazardly put together <laughs> don't forget that you know there are multiple moves involved so you know some of the some of the boxes might not entirely be the year that they say they are there they're off by a couple of years <clears throat> so then as a researcher i mean i go completely mental <laughs> <laughs> because I was like, if I find an 1897 letter in the 1893 box, that must mean I have to go through everything because the one thing that I will be looking for is going to be, in, you know, in what a mean? different. Oh no! Oh, so I love, I love systems. I love archives. <laughs> I love when they work. But these boxes were uh, wonderful because you see all these questions that people are asking. Like there must have been a copyright craze, <clears throat> you know. Um, you think of a game, mm -hmm. I mean, games are in there. Like, it's, it's, it's the overwhelming majority. What sort of games? Um, board games, you mean, or like sports or? Board games, uh, but also sports uh, uh, cards or, you know, anything, puzzles. Mm. And people try to copyright it, <laughs> like left and right. So word got out and obviously, I suppose, people realized the importance of this and, and that it could. Yeah. Or maybe, could yeah, help I them. guess, gets, you know, makes some money. <coughs> there mm. are things in there, like uh, the, the funniest thing I've seen is someone trying to register the letters of the alphabet, um, <laughs> but made in apple cores. <laughs> like actually bitten out of apples they 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 drew them and there it's the, the letters of the alphabet in apple cores and you're like what am i looking at did they send the apple cores into the no no they were the they were library. images because there, there's also that that flattening right so sometimes they they send the actual things there are pins attached there are so is it in a sense it, when it, once it's a once it's a photo once it's a photo though is it then a piece of art you know the letters of of the alphabet as apple cores oh, is that yeah, is, yeah, that's are a, they copywriting the, the work of art no, as opposed to the yeah that's a very good question no in this case it wasn't that wasn't the case but really? yeah, that's sometimes the case too right yeah and and it's complex isn't things, it oh it's so complex mm. and uh, some categories of work would never get registered as their actual category right paintings wouldn't 
necessarily be send in in two copies mm. uh, um, as a painting because if there's only one they then they would send photographs of them right. so there is yeah there's that level of complication as well how long did you spend in this place what is it the the library library of congress of congress uh, so how, I was how long there, um, for seven months seven months mm. working every day it's going through around the clock i just really? became obsessed wow yeah. Did you yeah. sort of, did you find yourself changing as a person during that period? Well, <laughs> did you lose touch with friends and family? <laughs> we said before we came in, this was going to be a therapy session. Yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> you know what was, I mean, it was wonderful to be there. Mm. I mean, the Kluge Centre is just incredible <clears throat> because uh, you're surrounded by people who are really invested in Do you have to research. get special permissions to go in there? I assume you do. No, the Kluge Center is is the center that gives you the award, right? So, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, once they vet you and they fingerprint you, you know, there's a lot of hoops before you really? get to go. Mm. But then when you're there, it's like this amazing oasis. Everybody has their cubicles, and <laughs> you're all working there. But almost everybody is in the same boat. Nobody brings partners, families, you know, and um, so you're there for the research, but you also have each other. And there's always someone who's up for, you know, doing anything. So socially, it's also really rich. Mm. And then you talk about research all the time and it's really amazing to be, um, yeah, surrounded by people who are, as invested in their topics mm. as you are in yours, which is really fascinating because I've learned so many things about, you know, other people's projects. <laughs> and it was like, have you made contacts? A... Have you made contacts from that you stay in touch with? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, we had sort of like a, an English contingency, although <laughs> we're not all um, English, but um, yeah, it was definitely the UK had its own. Um, like yeah, a historian's oh, playground fun. in there. Yeah. Would you describe yourself as, as a historian? How would you describe yourself? Ooh, very good question. I don't like labels. No, me neither. As soon as I put a label on myself, I want to break out. <coughs> Whatever the label is. No, seriously, I mean that. What would See, you, this what, is becoming a what, therapy session. What would, you t <laughs> what would you type on a, on a bio, on a, on a, a LinkedIn bio or something? I think maybe <laughs> I would say... You could tell me what you're not. Let's do that. Let's play that game. What I'm not. Yeah, because wow. I've often thought that. What am I not? And that sort of helps you define what you are. Because there's got to be things you're not. Yeah, there's lots of things that I'm not. But I don't know if <laughs> that could be a long game. This. Yeah, it exactly. could be a boring <laughs> podcast. <laughs> um, no, I think I would say film scholar. Oh, nice. That's a nice title. Because yeah. uh, it sort of encompasses, because I also dabble a little bit in making things or editing. And, and it's just like, I think. I didn't even realize when I came here, because we are called the BA in film, we're not film studies, we're not film production, and I actually feel like that is, I mean, it is truly my course. I wish I, uh, you know, could have done it when I made that choice, because I venture in and out of that theory versus practice, mm. but also um, uh, analog, digital, all, all, all of it, and um, both his historically, but also contemporary, and and I have now found these wider topics like intellectual property or copyright specifically, and the archive, and and all of those things are both historically interesting to me, but also um, it has to be about now, right? History is about the now. Uh, I, at least it is to me. I'm not mm. interested in retelling a story for its historical accuracy. It is about what does it mean now to look at a story again? And this is what you said, right? Have you have you changed? The biggest realization came, and it was actually in a conversation I had with James Fair when I was there. Um, Who's a colleague of ours here? Yes. On the film course? Yes. <coughs> and... Um, and who wrote the film course, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry, Jim. No, I mean, that's, that that's very, very important. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's, it, has, it has his, uh, his fingerprints um, all over it, at least that's what I think. Mm -hmm. um, but it was in a conversation with him that I realized, um, and I think he said something to that effect where, you know, you have this archive and all this stuff is being kept there, but you are also going about your daily life 
like looking at this stuff and that's that's sort of a parallel and that was something that I c couldn't shake then anymore because I was like yeah this is this is actually about me leading my life here on a daily life uh, on a daily basis but looking at the life of someone else their daily life um, 130 years ago so and not not trying to extract yourself from that process basically yes exactly being aware that you are exactly, part of that process exactly and that's mm. uh, I mean it of course comes from what you said the structure mm. of the of the chapter but then the film I ended up making about the research uh, has that structure as well I address Ainsworth Ranspoffer because mm. that allowed me to juxtapose that um, that past with my present but also you know look at things how they are different and actually this links to the the, the photograph i have now. Ooh, um, the secret surprise photograph no but it's uh <laughs> it's it's such a for me it's a very creative and a useful way of looking at what is the same what is different how would you explain that to someone mm. how would i explain certain things that we how would i explain this <laughs> right and it's um and mm. it's a for me it's a very useful way of looking at the the past it is it is it, it can only be through the present and as you say i suppose it helps you to be empathetic towards your own audience that you're now writing for in the 21st century and my students and your students yeah I mean, my students are, and this is also, I mean, I've said this before, this is also why I ended up making uh, the film, because when I was in DC, I had a, a really great uh, Zoom conversation with Will, one of my other students, who was nominated for a prize at the time at Learning on Screen, and they had asked us to record like a, a, a thank you speech in case uh, he should win. And so we were talking on Zoom, and um, he asked me about the about the research, and I was like showing him pictures and stuff. But it was a mutoscope reel, and a mutoscope reel is uh, I mean it looks like a it looks like a spaceship out of a <laughs> sci-fi movie, but it's it's basically a core with hundreds, maybe even thousands pictures around. It's all, it's like a like a flip book. Oh, well, one of the things that you spin and look through, and it. Well, actually, it goes into the machine like that. Oh, and I you see. Look, you look into the mutoscope, which is sort of like oh. a kinetoscope as well, and oh, you would okay. put in a coin, and you were mm. right, and then you would see the. Uh, I think maybe you could even vary the speed, but you would see like Pope Leo is a, is a very famous one, right? He, and then you were for twenty seconds, you would see this move. And this is one of the brightest students. And he was like, oh, what is that? And it's not to say like, oh, you should know what this is. But I was like, oh, visually, this is so interesting. I need I need to show it to mm. them because it there is no point in me describing a mutoscope reel within two seconds. If you see it, you can you're like, oh, that mm -hmm. because if I ask them, what is the oldest um, audiovisual technology that you have ever seen um vhs I, possibly you know what the answer was one one student a couple <coughs> years ago goes oh yeah i remember in middle school or whatever it's called here um they they wheeled in this <laughs> card with this old vhs machine and i'm like <laughs> And I, so, so I was like, oh, wow, how am I going to explain to them mm. that for years I worked with nitrate and, <laughs> you know, we restored this. And, and I was like, I'm, I'm going to have to show it to them. And so that was really fun to do, to think of what it would mean to them and what would it mean today. Let's talk about that film a little bit, shall we? Mm. The, the Shadow yeah. Line. Yes. I made a note, actually, because mm. as I said before we came on, I've been experimenting with how I conduct these conversations. Mm. And I don't, use, I don't always have notes, but I thought I would try today. Yeah. Um, there was... Oh, I wanted to firstly say your narration throughout is like beautifully written and delivered. Thank I you. thought it was just so mesmerizingly... Thank you. ...delivered. That's it was wonderful. lovely. It was really nice. It's funny the other the other week when we showed it during the event, um, people didn't realize it was me. Also, I think because I, I mean, I feel very comfortable in English, but um, I I'm still sort of I take on the English of the people that I'm 
mm. surrounded with. So <laughs> because I was in the US for six or seven months, my, my accent did change a little bit. Mm. And so I think that's where... I think we all do that, to be honest, even, yeah. if, yeah, even if you're oh, native. Really, if you're yeah, native. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but also, you know what? I mean, um, now I'm, you know, I feel this is animated and stuff, but I, I did record this sort of, you know, I was by myself, <clears> you know, I have shave the text for a long time and then I tried to record it as calmly as I as I could and again it was delivered in the same style as your essay is in this book yeah that's where that's where it came from mm. for a while I didn't think that that was what it was going to be like but then I was like it's actually when I saw the eyes of Orson Welles, Mark Cousins' documentary, where he does that, he addresses Orson Welles, oh. and uh, and I was like, "This is it. <laughs> this is it. This mm. is this is so." I mean, it's it's a very creative way of writing. I have it never is, yeah. enjoyed writing as much as I did that script. No, oh, really. Yeah, because usually when I do something creative, like um, I, I designed uh, uh, the book, I mean, I don't even need coffee. You know, I get up and go like, I don't want to start. I never have that with writing. Like writing is hard. And, um, you know, sometimes even a physical aversion of sitting down, I think, you know, all academics would recognize that. And this creative way of writing I had, it, it felt like editing. It felt like working with pictures. It oh, was interesting. so... Like it was a joy to to do. So addressing somebody directly, as if you're writing them a letter, I just want, helps you to flow. Yeah, it feels I, more like a conversation, perhaps. I, I don't know what exactly it is. Maybe it is. I do like writing in the second form, which is. Um, is that what it's called? I'll take your word well, for it. Well, is that? Yeah, I don't know. No, but what do you say? The third, <laughs> I always get confused. It's first say, person, third person. Yeah, second person. So yeah, because it's the you, and it's okay. hardly ever. Well, you you don't necessarily write like that unless you write a letter. Mm. Um, but I really, really enjoy writing in that in that uh, voice. Mm. So now I'm going to have to make a decision, like if this becomes a book, because I'm still trying to figure that out. Can I keep this up? Can I do it again? For uh, a whole book? <laughs> yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Maybe you drift in and out of it. Yeah, maybe. Maybe you have chapters I mean, that are letters. This is what you said earlier, and I do really want to come back to that because I do really believe in um, the researcher putting themselves into the story because I only have this one reality. And, you know, the, the fact that I don't think there is... Oh my God! Now we've drifted into a whole other. God, I'm excited I, for what I, you're I don't say. think there is any objectivity, right? I mean, I can only see the world experience through my current reality and all these intersectional mm. things that. So, I think I think certain fields of research are more open to the idea of there not being objective truth than others. I yes. think probably the hard sciences and things. May, well, I don't know. I don't want to speak on behalf of them, but it yeah, feels but you like. Know what? Facts and reality and truth are not necessarily the same things, right? Mm -hmm. I do believe in some of these things, but maybe less so in... Or the co-construction of me and my own reality is very different from... I mean, you have to believe in a certain level of fact just to live a normal life. Otherwise, you'd probably be locked up in a mental asylum if you no, literally no, 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 lived your sure. life going around. For sure. But None I of this is real. <laughs> right. But I, I don't think that those are necessarily the same things. Mm, OK. Um, and I think that's how I experienced my undergraduate. You know, we were just handed a book called Film History. And I think it was presented in my memory as this is what happened. It was you know, waves and directors, almost all of them white and male. Um, and this is this is what you were told. This is what happened. And then I think what I've become interested in over time is actually how was that book compiled? How can we look at those stories again? Because mm. they are more complicated than the way that it was so presented. The, the, the the story of how the book was compiled is actually more interesting than the book itself, perhaps. Absolutely. I, I think if, if I would, you know, put and, any... And why things on, were omitted as well, that, that sort yes, of thing. Yes. Yeah. So I'm way more interested in the historiography of the story than the actual history. <laughs> no, but this is exactly why I looked at that first motion picture. This is really what happened when I got there. Um, so I had always 
had the hope that the needle in the haystack part of that story would be like a nice secondary you know effect it was never the the main story but the main story was always like how have we told this history and the history of telling that history that is a really fascinating thing to look <laughs> at because that that is punctuated by right the interest the historical interest over over time and how that has changed so the historiography is what i look at mm. uh, do you think we've improved the way we tell stories about ourselves these days in terms of that being more equal and being more representative of what's uh, of the people involved and things do you think we're better at that now than we were back then in terms you know you said it's predominantly white men are we getting better at that well that's a big sigh i know well if you compare today with you know october 6 1893 then yes but progress is slow yeah are we are we there? No, I think we will never be there, right? Because this is this is why an archive is so fascinating because you look at these are the voices that were that were kept. These are the voices that are allowed to be heard. And that's I I actually think that through those archival presences you see the archival absences. That to me is really fascinating mm. I, I remember my mum had a book um when i was younger I, I remember seeing the cover of it lots that said uh history mm. and on the other side of the book said her story right yeah, yeah <laughs> and yeah. then inside it was all these comical little things you yeah, know, yeah 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 what what the man thinks happened and then what the, <laughs> the woman's telling yeah, the real yeah, thing yeah, that's yeah, 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 yeah. it was a comical kind of you know comic strip sort of style yeah. but i always remember that and it, i just i just um reflected on that a lot you know and the power of those words right mm. not even realizing that that's how the word <laughs> is is that the actual uh, origin of the word his I, story I, who well. knows yeah maybe i don't i don't know i i wouldn't be surprised mm. <laughs> it's probably some latin origin yeah i don't know <laughs> We'll have to look that up now. Yes. We'll Google it later. Yes. Um, so what led you to this point? Talk a bit about your maybe, um, well, growing up, first of all, your childhood. What what led you to become the person you are now and to be interested in this particular field of research? This Let's, is therapy. Though. We're going to go right back there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's funny because uh, the the book of my PhD in the, in the preface, I sort of um, go into that a little bit. Um, I think... What I remember is that I was glued to the television, like stories, stories, visual stories. I also read a lot. Like I loved the library. I loved school, but I loved the television. Like <laughs> it, there was a world out like there. Like every kid, right? <laughs> Nearly. Yeah, but you know what? No, I, I know quite a few people who who didn't have that as obsessively as I had. Um, <laughs> I think it was escapism and I think it was a sign of a world out there where magical things were happening. This is way, you know, pre-internet. So What sort of stuff did you watch? Can you remember? Everything. Everything. Yeah, you know, like everything. <laughs> also, I mean, I grew up on the border of Holland, Belgium, Germany. So we, we had lots of, uh, you know, the, the foreign broadcasts as well. So everything. Really? Yeah. Like German children's TV, um, you know, ev everything. Can you speak um, the languages as a consequence of that? Yeah, yeah. Really? But also the um, fiction, non-fiction, it's like everything. <laughs> I mean, m movies, you know, movies, the the big Hollywood classics, maybe not so much the classic, but yeah, me, maybe feature films was like the big thing. But also TV shows, I was obsessed how, with this. How young are we talking here when you became obsessed? Like five, six, older? Uh, maybe the awareness of the obsession is later, maybe 12, 13, you know, there was a particular soap opera, um, you know, that I was really invested in and I would bike home from school to see like my favorite characters get married because I figured out what day of the week that was going to happen. And, you know. Do you still watch soaps now? No. No, I can't stand no. soaps. I'm glad you said no, that. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I, I completely <laughs> lost that. I mean, you know good on everybody who still does but um i remember uh there was a dutch tv show about a hospital that i became so obsessed with that you know i i 
wrote the stars. I like collected their pictures. It was, and and I wanted to become a surgeon. My entire high school. This, this is a therapy session. I wanted to become a surgeon because my favorite character on the. Oh, on so what show, went wrong, Cloudy? Yeah. What went wrong? <laughs> no, you know what? I realized there was a there was a fascinating shift. Because it had been about the form of the the story, the television. Ah, so it was a long. realization. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, that's, that's a nice, was, yeah. Yeah, it was a really great chef where you like, it had nothing to do with the content of uh, the hospital. Because now if I walk into a hospital, I like nearly faint. I can't stand the, the smells in there. <laughs> uh, if I see blood, I faint. You know what I mean? It's like, man, I would, I would have been the worst surgeon. <laughs> but... Um, it was all along about so the it, was, it was storytelling. Yeah. Okay. So when um, when did you start realizing that you wanted to work in film specifically as opposed to I don't know writing stories or something like yeah. this? Yeah. Very very early. Yeah. Uh, I mean I I I just don't remember a time when I wasn't like I you know consume so much of this stuff now obviously a lot more than back then but this is what i what i highlight in the preface of the other book it's um the the times that i went to the cinema when i was younger were were so special it wasn't on a weekly basis you know i mean i, I can count them on one maybe two hands my entire uh, a use and that's that's what makes them stand out the, the experience of going to the cinema was just absolute magical to me mm. and um and so that i mean i didn't know that that's what you could study <laughs> no what i mean it was just so magical like i don't think i wondered like how they were made it was just like i don't think you do do you when, you, no. when you're younger really no, no but i Take also it for didn't, granted yeah and i didn't think that that was work mm. right um <laughs> i mean et was the most magical thing i'd ever seen so but i didn't think about how that was made and i was only i couldn't even understand how it made me feel but that's what that was about right mm. it was just absolute magic i still think it's one of the greatest films ever made it's so yeah I, so i understood that 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 was really, really special to me very early on. But then, um, like I said, that wasn't necessarily something you studied. So um, in, in Holland, we had this, it was called an almanac. Uh, it was like a, a, a book with really thin sort of a newspaper paper with all the courses that you could study at university and you know a higher education in, in the entire country, I, and, right? pre-internet <laughs> so you would get this book from i'm assuming the library or the school you it sounds would... a bit like the yellow pages you know the phone book yes used exactly to have. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly but... what it looked like that really thin paper yeah. is just had a different cover <laughs> and you could and and i went through it page by page what is it that you can study uh and then there was the page film and television studies and i was like that's it but wow. obviously that didn't go down very well uh, <laughs> in my home. So uh, also at the time, what I should what I should say is um, film and television studies was a so-called, we called it a head study, which meant the Dutch system as it was at the time, you needed to have a first year degree, which is called a propedizer, in something else. And for film and television, it was either a language history or sociology or theater studies and theater was probably even further uh, uh from any sort of world of possibilities from any proper career oh gosh yeah. no i mean uh, <laughs> but also i didn't necessarily have that uh, interest at that time um but i had this real crisis uh, going into the going into the final year of my high school which is when you sort of you know you you've worked in uh, within a certain kind of profile in order to go to university. So I'd gone the medical route, right? I was I was really into like science and you know all this stuff. Um, <laughs> and all of a sudden I wanted to I wanted to change. I was like, I don't, I don't want to go to medical school. And um, and so I started thinking back of what of these possibilities was I good at? And then I only once, so in Holland we grade out of 10, and I only had, 
like uh, I had a 10 on my report card once and that was for French. So I was like, I'll study French. <laughs> and so that was decided. I think, you know, my parents were on board and uh, there I went. So it was French and to... then film was the, yeah, so what I... did you call it? The head? The... Yeah, it was called uh, Cop Studi, which means, yeah. The, the one the top up or whatever that's I called. See, right. I don't think it exists anymore. It didn't have its own first year degree, so that's how new it was. And it was, you know, even in the news it was sort of regarded as this thing that you laughed at, ha 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 film studies. <laughs> um and now, you know, it's like one of the biggest we understand that, you know, studying the power of media has its um right? Benefits? Yeah, benefits. What, what do you think of this idea that, um, that, that kids especially can have too much screen time then? If, if, you know, you presumably, well, I would say that you are a shining light of the opposite argument to that. You know, if you said you were glued to the screen and you were obsessed with it yeah. when you were growing up. And look, look what it's become. Look. Yeah, <laughs> well, but you know what? I once read this amazing article about someone having to go to a local diner to watch a show on a TV. This this was a, a US article, and I wish I had prepared this. Uh, it was, I think, someone trying to come to terms with uh, realizing that they were gay and they weren't allowed to watch this particular show at home. So they were going to the local diner where the show was on that had a gay character on it, and they think it was about this uh, uh, identification. Um, and I thought that was so fascinating because the article spoke about the power of not seeing. And so I wonder if, of course, you know, when I grew up there, there was sort of a not watching TV was the penalty, right? It was, uh, and there was also a limitation of screen time. It was like not mm. right after school. That's when you need to do the homework. So I think we've always had versions of that. Mm. Uh, some kids like to read so much that maybe their penalty is, you know, not no being books. allowed to read or. Mm. Um, well, people often say, don't they, that when um, you know storybooks were first, I don't know when this was, but that they were kind of lauded as the same way that TV now is, you know, it's like, yeah. you mustn't read those books kind of thing. Yeah. So it's just, I, but, but yeah, go on, Karen, in terms of screen, no, screen the, time, do you think that I find it a really difficult conversation because, mm. um, when I see it being used as a sort of soothing mechanism, um, recently on vacation right at a table mm. <laughs> next to us you know um but if the alternative is that that kid is screaming screaming at the table next to me i'd rather that they would and they're so obsessed right i mean i'm looking at this kid being really obsessed yeah with this, the little YouTube yeah it turns video. them into zombies kids yeah Trans they're so transfixed on the screen but at the same time that's probably what i look like when i watched the sound of music for the 20th Absolutely. I mean, everyone gets, I mean, you know, I don't know anyone who doesn't, when they watch a film that they love, you know, become transfixed Absolutely. on it, hypnotized by Absolutely. it almost. I think, I think maybe the argument is a little bit too basic that there's too much screen time, um, unless we're talking specifically about damaging your eyesight or something. But I think screen time, just because of some other reason that it might affect your behavior or something or your personality or something like this. Is probably a bit too basic because it's surely it depends on the content you are watching. It's like saying, you know, you're spending too much time living your life because if, you know, if you grew up yeah. around lots of crime and ag yeah. aggression, mm. so I think it's more specific probably, isn't it? Uh, but e but even even saying that, I mean, you know, there's people going about violence in games and things and affecting kids, but actually i don't think there's actually much evidence of that either right exactly <laughs> no no i mean lots of studies are being done right um i i actually don't have a black and white answer to that i'm like <laughs> no it's it's like yeah is it important for a child to discover its own creativity and maybe play outside and run about yes mm. but is i mean i, I I think reading is virtuous. I mean, it's 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 an incredible skill. Mm. But is is watching a screen? I don't know. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to rank it. Mm. But should it be limited? I think 
probably all things should be limited. Yeah, my mum always used to say everything in moderation. Yeah, well, I don't <laughs> think I agree with that, but um, no, no, I'll tell in, her. I'll tell her later. No, no, no. But in, yeah. in general, because there, are, it's it's a problematic argument once you speak about addiction or you know, um, mm. food choices, all of those things. Mm. Anyway, a whole other <laughs> conversation. What were your parents like then? You say they limited your screen time and also that, um, you know, going into film was uh, a bit contentious at the time. I don't remember not ever being allowed not to watch anything, which which actually is an amazing memory. Um, I only remember once that I wasn't allowed to watch a film uh, until its very end because it was late, but also I think maybe they were expecting guests or whatever. And that that is also a very strong memory of not being able. So this <laughs> is this is what I meant earlier with, um, uh, uh, you know, you said, oh, look, look at what you've become. But part of bar, part of the fascination is also because I remember it being limited, mm. right? There wasn't as much. I mean, we didn't have 24 hours uh, uh, around the clock content. So you were trying to get what you could get. And one of my strongest memories <clears throat> is having to stay home at the time that something was broadcast. And that that sometimes would lead to conflicts if you were scheduled to do other things. And so that is completely different now, right? So yeah. I, I think the tension between being allowed, being not allowed, or being able to, being not able to, because it wasn't a matter of that you could put on content at any time of the day if you had woken up early or whatever. I mean, Saturday morning was like, you know, uh, c cartoons, I don't really remember this all as well but you know what i mean Absolutely, it's yeah. um it, it's, a, it's a massive culture shift and yes. it affects people in different ways i think i always think about this um you know how uh, you parents say to kids eat your dinner and then you can have dessert yes you're basically saying dessert is the thing you want yes yeah but that's you can't true. have that's so true yeah it's that, that. <laughs> i think that's often you know what you can't have is the thing you most desire absolutely um, and then you get it sometimes and it's or the not what you thought it was your plate yeah exactly and then you don't you know like i didn't want this yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just like these primal sort of instincts of maybe jealousy and uh you know just desire for, for, for things isn't it drives us sometimes well and you know i mean but we all understand that desire for i mean being allowed to watch television was like the <laughs> biggest thing right <laughs> I guess so, yeah, yeah. But also, I remember... It was very like, frustrating when I was told no. Oh, you know, I remember being gosh. very frustrated as a kid a lot of the time when I wasn't allowed to do... But also the way, didn't it play shape games. your... Yeah, the, the, your image of the world, I mean, was partially shaped by what you saw on TV, right? Yeah, I think massively, yeah. yeah. Cultural I references? Thought, yeah, I think that's probably... That effect has kind of exponentially grown now so that, you know, kids have this... Uh, especially maybe Western kids, let's say, will have a very yeah. similar culture because they all engage in the same right. things. Although, having said that, the audience is also more fragmented, so perhaps they're not engaging in the same things yeah. because, you know, back when I was growing up, it was like everyone would watch the Saturday night ed entertainment show, whatever this it was at the time. The Gladiators, having. for example, oh, really? I used to watch. Yeah. You know, and then everyone would talk about that, so that yes. forms your culture. So That's I suppose... Exactly right so mm. Wednesday morning in my school was very much so the the medical uh, <laughs> hospital show I talked about was broadcast on Tuesday evening right. Wednesday morning the whole school was talking about it that doesn't exist anymore no at all no not in the same way but I think it probably still exists in microcosms like my sure you know kids talking about the latest TikTok dance or whatever it is these days you know from three seconds ago yeah, <laughs> yeah and then it's another one I yeah. know yeah and then oh my god yeah but, so what are your big cultural references when it comes to tv like big world changing events that you've experienced through the tv oh well, world changing events just made me remember the death of princess diana right i was on holiday in malta at the time mm. um, and that came up on the screens in the lobby area mm. and you know that sort of a shell shock on our holiday yes. kind of thing yeah but you know i don't know if that's that what you're really asking but no, no, i no, remember that are, very vividly I, I don't associate that necessarily with the TV. I do remember the moment. I remember, you know, where I was standing, who told me, and mm. where we were living at the time. Mm. 
but really experiencing it through the TV, I think, was different. But other than that, I think probably my uh, my predominant uh, memories of TV, none of them really spring into mind, but I think maybe playing games more so mm. through the TV was uh, more... Oh, really? I've never for done me. That. I mean, it caused me more... Uh, more powerful emotions, let's say. Yes. I used to play a lot of football games and things, and if you know what you lose football console, you know computer oh, game football. Sorry, yeah, not, sorry. Not, not through live TV. I mean, you. Yeah, yeah, no, just a computer, just a screen. console. Yes, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> you're yeah. Like, do I really I'm inventing need to a new thing. What, what game is <laughs> I'm inventing a new medium here. <laughs> no, you but talk. you know what? I mean, um, <laughs> I remember it was the most powerful thing. This must have been somewhere in the nineties. You could call into sort of a music channel, and you could line Request. up the Request, oh yeah, your next God. song. Yeah, that was that was. The I worst. spent so much money <laughs> on that. That's how MTV started, wasn't it? Really like that, I think. Yeah. Or was that I just more playlists that they played out? I, I know, know some of the channels were like that. I remember. Uh, yeah. I think. Oh, now I'm completely blanking on the name, but there were one or two where it's like, I, I was so obsessed with certain videos, and I would just request it over and over again. <laughs> I mean, Bush, Silence is Not the Way, is one of the most beautiful videos I had ever seen. Kate and I Bush. would just No, uh, Bush, oh. the, the band of... Um, I've not heard of them. Gwen Stefani's husband. Oh, okay. A former husband. Right. Um, oh, my God. Yeah, I'm, like, I butchering all the... Anyway, um, <laughs> I would just request it over and over again. Mm. That was so powerful that you could interact with the television. Mm. It was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that's what you meant with football things. No. Are you old enough to have seen, um, like, the falling of the Berlin Wall and stuff like that? No. What no. year was that? I think that might have been 89? around... 89? Oh, yeah, so I was three then. Mm. Yeah, so, no. so you probably wouldn't no. watch it. <laughs> you weren't watching it. <laughs> but I think mm. I can definitely remember some films, some iconic films, like Indiana Jones when I was growing up yeah, was a big yeah, one yeah. for me. That was, like, you know, the, you know, and just coming out of the cinema and wanting to be Indiana Jones. The same with um, one of the Star Wars films. I'm not a massive Star Wars fan, to be honest, but when I went to see one of the... No, (laughs) I've seen maybe a couple, but honestly, the acting is so stiff and wooden, I can't get on with it. No, I mean, it's it's amazing how much I can shock our students by saying (laughs) I've never seen them. And the longer I haven't seen them, the funnier it gets. To be honest, I I don't consider those, um, those kind of big studio blockbuster franchises required viewing for film students right. to be honest right. i don't see them as it's probably not fair to say they're not culturally significant but they're not they don't feel just never happened <laughs> i don't i don't even <laughs> care that much about whether they are significant it just has <laughs> you know never happened you've seen other things but what about uh, so is indiana jones the film that sorry i'm like interviewing no you. it's all right <laughs> is that the film where you go like oh that's what i want to be is that did you have more films like that um like they instantly changed your life oh in terms of working in film well no, to be honest i even... i drifted my way through life until i was about 26 mm. <laughs> honestly but don't we all <laughs> I have the feeling I'm still drifting. <laughs> it was only it was only when I was working on building sites for seven years after leaving sixth form college. Whoa. So I was a chippy building roofs. Wow. Um, and then my girlfriend, who's now my wife, convinced me, not convinced me, kind of revealed to me that creativity was my wow. biggest attribute. That's amazing. So then I started looking around and sort of, um, you know, got into media. So I don't have a massive... So you went um, back to school later on? Yeah, I went to... Oh, I did a year at college, an access degree, which is amazing that those things exist yeah. these days for yeah, people yeah, yeah. like me. Because, you know, otherwise I would probably still be on booming sites now. Wow. Stuck and depressed and down on life. And it was really like that. Oh, my then. God. I This is so funny you say that because I, I think you're consistently one of the happiest people who work here. You're, like, always <laughs> like this. <laughs> No, seriously, you're always like... Maybe that's the benefit of perspective. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, I, I often think that, you know, um, it, it, a lot of it is about perspective, isn't it? You know, I often think someone who's come from poverty who then comes to this country, for example, yeah. and gets a minimum wage job is right. going to be over the moon. Yeah. You know, maybe they have a, a flat to live in yeah. and they, they'd lived in poverty in a yeah. different country or something yeah, yeah, previously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's all just about perspective, isn't it? And someone who's it's born in this country perspective. and then drops down and lives in, in yes. that state, yes. exactly the same uh, condition yeah. but because they came from maybe a better position previously yeah now has the perspective that this is terrible and whatever yeah 
I think it's all, yeah. Happiness is a lot to do with the perspective in my mind. It's, I think that's the quote of the day. <laughs> no, but it is though. It really, really is. Because, you know, I have had jobs where if they had paid me five times more, I wouldn't have stayed and, and vice versa. Jobs where maybe I didn't, uh, you know, maybe like a student job that you thought content wise was really interesting, but you wouldn't make enough. It's it's all about perspective. And now I cannot, I cannot believe that this is my job. I was going to ask that earlier. Like, is is do you do you find it amazing that you get paid to do the stuff you do? I mean, it's, I, I mean, don't tell anyone. Shh. No, but I, <laughs> I I still cannot understand that. I mean, I have the feeling that I learn for a living. Mm. Maybe that's a bit overcharged, but. <laughs> No, I, I mean, mean, you do a lot more, presumably, with, with on the film degree and stuff as well. No, sure. I mean, yeah. there's lots of admin involved. But um, <laughs> it's just like, I didn't realise how much I love teaching. I mean, it, it's such a mirror that they hold back up to you where, you know, I have to find new and creative ways of making what I think is interesting, translate that into making it of interest to them. Uh, but at the same time, they hand me so much of stuff that I would never experience or gravitate towards myself. But also, <clears throat> the, I don't know, it's just it's just incredible. I have a feeling that might be testament to your own style when it comes to teaching students as well, that you that you allow to be enriched and influenced by your students, because I don't think every teacher I ever encountered mm. allows that open sort of dialogue. Mm. So I think that's probably testament to your own approach oh, thanks for well. saying that but I, <laughs> I also wouldn't know how else to do it because uh, l like I said you know when when we were handed the big bible called film history that was in a time where there is 200 people in a lecture theater and there's one omniscient narrator in the front and they throw this monologue at you there was no interaction and and those were you know old style lectures mm. and that I mean, it doesn't exist anymore, but it's also, I mean, it's way more fun to have a dialogue with these really interesting people. Do you reflect on those experiences of, of the traditional lecture and think that's what I, do you ever think, you know, that's what I don't want to do? I didn't realise at the time because I thought they were imparting me with knowledge I didn't have. With the I mean, knowledge, yeah. I'm, the yeah, only exactly. knowledge, that, yeah. That's, that's, the, that's the real issue for sure. Mm. So I was really interested in, you know, watching all these strange movies that they made us watch and there's virtue in that too because I don't think I would have gravitated towards you know Dr. Caligari on a on a wooden uh, 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 bench in some you know uh, lecture theater from from a bad VHS probably that's how we <laughs> saw them right um, you know German silent uh, uh, movie so <laughs> but I do have such vivid memories of that so but what I thought was interesting in in evolving on from that is that I started questioning uh, the stories and, and right how how they were told. Um, so I think there is there's a little a virtue in that because I I sometimes feel I wish we could make the students. I I don't believe in sort of this is the canon and this is what you should have seen. They need to discover what they like themselves. But I do feel that sometimes we have the role of guiding them outside of their own little comfort uh, zones because, um, you know, I'm very comfortable and familiar with silent film and it takes the world for me to watch one at home on a laptop. Right. So I cannot expect them to do that either and then see some of the magic of it. So I think sometimes you do have the role of guiding them into uh, how amazing Buster Keaton can be, you know, <laughs> when you see it on the big screen and mm. um, with seven year olds present. That's when you really see Buster Keaton. Oh, my God. With seven year olds. They understand everything. And they really? and when you hear a seven year old laugh in a cinema, the sort of body, Eden, the body humor, the, the everything. Thing. Yeah, it's the storytelling. It's a, mm. they get it. Mm. And and then you realize, oh, we've taken this to a degree where we take it maybe a little too serious. <laughs> but it's one of my magical memories of being at the Netherlands Film Museum and they showed uh, a restoration of the general, which I think is, you know, 
again, one of the greatest films ever made. But they were seven year old, you know, however old they were. They were they were small children in the audience, and just hearing them laugh at <laughs> that story, I was like, this is how that was meant. Amazing. I I, I remember this just reminded me of a. I was on a ferry, I think in Italy somewhere. Well, not in Italy, on the waters, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Uh, but Mr. Bean came on the ferry and there were right. a mixture of uh, different nationalities on this ferry. Right. But everyone was watching and yeah. laughing to Mr. Yes, Bean. So exactly. I, it just that just kind of made it, me realise I mean, how amazing that style of comedy yeah. can be. And everyone understands it. You don't need uh, dialogue or words yeah. or anything. It's just everyone gets that the storyline. That is the line. power of silent cinema, right? It's fantastic. I think we've covered off most of this stuff anyway, oh, really? except for the book, really. Oh, okay. Uh, you need to just pull your mic around as well when you when you're oh, ready. Oh yes. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Welcome back. Thanks. Welcome back. <laughs> we were, were just saying. Refreshed. We were just saying off mic. Well, what were we saying? <laughs> it's vanished from my mind. Yeah, we were talking about um, <laughs> legacy. Oh, legacy, and remembering the mind? first of something. Why people are so obsessed with yes. the first of yes. anything. Yeah. Go on. You you sound like you were going to say something profound. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> Put the pressure up now. <laughs> I've, I've just been thinking about this quite a bit because mm. this is how we how we tend to look at history, right? The first of things, and uh, just to annoy, I'm going to move your mic a little bit. Yeah. Oh, you can move this. Up. You can kind of move it around if you want. Yeah. Exactly where you is this okay? <coughs> uh, also, why you were sitting differently just now? <laughs> That's okay. Hello. It's not. It's not like film continuity. It's not. That's it's true. Okay. That's true. It'll be all right. I just want to make oh, sure I we're getting good audio. Here. Yeah. yeah I is want... it? Is it good now? It sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, you've um, been thinking about why people are obsessed with the first thing. Well, but look, look at how it comes into your own life, like all the time. It's about maybe. Uh, one of your children winning a sports game in mm. school. It's, uh, you know, all of these things. Oh, but that's the first person who did this. And oh, what was the first close up? And this was the first camera that did this. Or if you talk about games, oh, remember this first game in which. Mm. And you said you also uncovered the third um, paper print, but no one talks about that. Yeah, that, so everyone I, talks about the first. Yeah, so I was looking at these five, but it was at some point it became a, a deduction game, right? So out of the five, we've always known two, four, and five. Uh, two and four are no, two, four, and five are identified, and of the fifth, we don't have any deposit materials, but we do know what it is. And one and three, no deposit materials, and we had no titles. But all of a sudden, when I saw the clue to the puzzle, so the clue to the puzzle was that I started checking Dixon's credits, and there was a huge distinction between what he said was photographed and copyrighted by him versus just photographed. Mm -hmm. Once I had that clue, I then could compare all the credits I could ever find and then it became a deduction game. And then when I came across the, the letter with the fragment in it, and there was a, the biggest clue in which he said, this is the one that I just sent in. And so when I knew that that one was the first, I also then immediately knew what the third was. <coughs> I don't think that in, you know, what has it been? So uh, uh, actually, Friday, it will have been a year. So the, the 30th of June. It, it, oh, really? Yeah. So you discovered? So, yeah. Okay. So that uh, sorry, happened. not discovered. No, identified. Yeah. identified. <laughs> no, actually, I didn't identify it on that day because oh, okay. it was just so overwhelmed. <laughs> um, so yeah, a year. And uh, no one has asked me a question about that third. Go on then. Let's go for it. Uh, so, no, but it's I think so there's something distinct about the first yes. of something. I, I think we like to have heroes as well, don't we? And you think of the person who did something first as somehow more of a genius or better than everybody else because they got there first. Do you know what I mean? It's like I a completely competition type understand thing, isn't it? what you mean. But <laughs> in this case, there, there are so many buts because it depends on the definition that we use, whether it was even the first right mm. it was it was the first deposit by dixon while he worked for edison uh for something that we yeah but now... that's not a headline cloudy no, that's what i mean that's what i mean because yeah. you know what we want is a soundbite yes we want easy clickable you know exactly well this is what podcasts are for so, yes. so you've now 
he educated everybody. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Um, but I find it, but, but I, I also was thinking there needs to be more to this. And, and where I've landed now is there is no way that we can encompass or understand or embrace the entirety of history in all its richness. So by focusing on the first, which seems to be an identifiable point mm. is a way to reduce the maybe, timeline yeah and almost, the information yeah. that we that we retain mm, that's a really good point because yeah. the funny thing is i mean even I, I was thinking how could i put this more poetically when i was writing the script and there was a time <coughs> that i was thinking oh you know people would ask you like oh you you know do you remember your first kiss yeah of yeah. course you do mm. do you remember the third <laughs> Yeah. It was probably with the same girl. Well, <laughs> no, but I mean, it might be. But Maybe. you go like, I would have to think. Yeah, right? because, because, yeah the, f the first is special because it represents 100% of the experiences of that thing for you, isn't That's it? That's a At beautiful that point. way of saying it. I, I often think, uh, because I've heard this idea that you know how life seems to speed up as you get older. Yes, and it does, right? <laughs> <laughs> because, because when you're one day old, yeah. one day is 100% 100%. of your lived experience. Yes. Yeah, so that's yeah. a long time. And when you go from 99 to It's that perspective to thing again. It's 1%. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, less than one because it's one day, isn't it? But a, a year, oh, yeah, the year. Yeah, the year, year is yeah, then 1%. Yeah yeah, 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 exactly. So no, it's maybe I, a similar thing. It's like, But it's also a way of comprehending what has happened. Also, mm. it's way more difficult to go like, what was the what was the third of something? Or, you know, whatever. Yeah, and when would you stop number. as well, you know? Yeah, exactly. What was the 63rd? Yeah, <laughs> no one that's cares. The, that's the thing. Um, we have learned not to care. Mm. And I think maybe historians are also in the market of... So I once read, which, which was so funny to me because it stuck with me ever since, that if you do historic work, you're even you're either a splitter or a lumper, which I kind of like as a description. And so it means you either delve into something so deeply that you split out like, oh, it's important what you ate this morning because that meant that this afternoon this and that happened and then you changed the world and lumpers are invested in I'm going to look at your entire lifetime. Uh, and what happened in the span of that and condense lifetime. it into a lump yeah well and then you have to you know put it in some sort of comprehensible narrative and i Splitters thought that was really interesting That's yeah. Nice, yeah and then i i read an alternative of that is uh, surfers or divers which is also <laughs> really interesting right surf surfers are sort of like you know you try to cover a wide area by but you can't go as deep so you, you skim the surface and then you decide to dive somewhere. I don't know, I, I, like, mm. I like those uh, analogies t for understanding. And I think, I also like to think that I'm doing a little bit of both. I do mm. like dive and split, but I think it is in order to say something about now. Okay. Like the questions that are emerging at that time on a human level. So you dive and you pull up the treasures and then surf across to to the to the next <laughs> island to, to deliver the news. Yes, exactly. It's a nice analogy. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. <laughs> oh, that would be so funny. But I, I, I was told as well when I was um, at university that uh, uh, an, inch, uh, an inch deep and a mile wide, um, mm. I should say it the other way around, an inch, yeah. an inch wide and mm -hmm. a mile deep is better mm -hmm. it, it, better but that's probably actually wrong isn't it better is the wrong word but it's it's maybe perhaps richer research if you do that very that's, specific thing uh, that's what i tend <clears throat> to say to definitely students who mm. are making grad projects because it is way more at least for me it's way more creatively fulfilling to become the mini specialist in uh something smaller but that you know a lot about than maybe a little about a lot i don't know i did i i i think there's room for all of those things it's just mm. that you tend to have a preference mm. oh. <laughs> but I it's 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 so interesting when you delve into these people's lives because at some point i mean i think i i think i was trying to understand who answered rance buffard is and you you think you have it all 
figured out, but that's of course impossible. Because then you read something else and you go like, well, actually, in in a way, I I have been looking at more documentation where I go like, wow, that's out of character. Mm. And then I discuss that with other people who are specialists in the in the field. And then you go like, yeah, that would be out of character. And so mm. it's because then you you try to look at the processes that they were involved in, like how out of character would something be? And this is sort of what we were talking about earlier, right? So if if a hundred years from now, something would, um, I don't even know if this is gonna work, what I tried to say. So no, I said like, I have this impression that you were always like balanced and fun and happy. Yeah. But if then something- Someone would uncovers on, the truth. Yes. <laughs> No, but you see, so I think that you could say like, oh, something would be really out of character for you, right? A hundred years from now, someone's trying to tell a story that Tom threw the furniture around because he was so angry. Only once. That was only once. No, <laughs> no you know what I mean? And then yeah, if absolutely. You, yeah. If you would I mean, I've, had, I've definitely life. had my moments. Yeah. But, yeah. Not around here, though, right? <laughs> but everyone's very nuanced, aren't they? Everyone's, you know, there's always more to the, to, to people sure. than, what, than what meets the eye. But I also think that that's so interesting about doing history because I'm convinced that this is how I looked at the archive in my PhD. Um, these things aren't, you know, God given, you know, including intellectual property law archiving. These are all processes that are based on decisions and people people interpret those decisions Humans. and they make those decisions mm. and they sometimes break uh, w with their right with their processes it's would you say in some way then all research is about humans well all of it yeah maybe uh there was a quote no, but I, I, I can imagine that there's research that is not but yeah talking about what you were just saying um i i wrote down the the final sentence of your your essay is it called an essay is that right to call it an essay I, I in this or a, an essay, yeah an essay yeah. um it makes me happy very happy mm. to think that you and i are tiny spots in each other's histories with gratitude cloudy mm. i thought that was lovely sign off mm. um and i was going to sort of ask you but you've you've almost almost already delved into it yourself. But do you do you find yourself uh, in a relationship with these characters from years yeah, ago? Very much so. Um, I I remember <coughs> I had several addresses when I was in DC during the fellowship, and there would be moments where I remember particularly it was a cold morning, um, and I was walking to the library. But you walk. Uh, by the backside of the U.S. Um, Supreme Court, which is next door, and then you see—I mean, it's it's magical. This that kind of weather. You have that blue winter sky, and the 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 sort of the the cherry blossoms that are coming out that pink, and then that white marble, and those three colors together are just so stunningly uh, visual. Um, and then you're standing there and you go like, but these buildings are old enough for this person to have seen it, mm. right? And then you start wondering, so w where did he live? How did he come to the library in the morning? And then there are, there are little, you know, and then you go down rabbit holes and then that information is findable. Right, there are postcards that he sent home in which he like describes his life or the hotel where he was staying or that he, where he lived it took him about an hour to walk sometimes he would take his horse uh, and actually he he wasn't necessarily at the Library of Congress because at that time the library was still in the capital but which is across the street and then he would tie his horse to the I mean those just imagining what someone's life was like and this was just someone going about their day. Mm. But it happened to <clears throat> involve these decisions that have repercussions for us. So this is how I started seeing it as these long lines of, we are connected, right? <laughs> That's a fascinating thought. And he <laughs> doesn't realize that 
that you know about me but this is also maybe in a parallel universe he knows you exist and he's and he's studying <laughs> yeah. you at the end of your life <laughs> oh my god can you imagine making making a movie about that um but there is something really so a former colleague of mine at the netherlands film museum described this really really beautifully in a, in an essay that he wrote because you're sitting at a steam back table right a table through which you roll the film and you go backwards and forwards and there are so many people populating these these uh, films particularly the non-fiction ones and because it, usually in the in the early non-fiction work they stare directly into the camera mm -hmm. and you have this moment with a person where you go like that person is staring right at me but you know that they're not there anymore and that is that is a crazy experience mm. because also over the time of working on a title and restoring it, you kind of have the feeling that you get to know the more you project all these things onto their lives. Mm. And um, I think I can, I think I can, um, yeah, I think I've, I've felt that same feeling you're describing before looking at old photos yeah. and especially it seems more so with children from years ago for some reason yeah. that hits me yeah. that they're now probably have grown up yeah. and died. Yeah. And you think, I don't know. I, I wonder if there's a term to describe that feeling. That's a good, good question. It, it, can't, it can't be only you and I who feel that. No, 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 no. <laughs> and I've, I've seen it described. I, I also have it with pets in pictures, mm. like dogs running around. Who no longer exist. And yeah. it feels like a part of their soul is captured mm. in that photo. Yeah. But particularly, and, and lots in those early copyright deposits, um, is, is, yeah, people staring at the at the camera and you <laughs> have the feeling that you're looking into their world but in a weird way they're looking back out at you oh. no i find that but that's <laughs> but that's the connection that's the story mm. right that's a narrative that you make up but this is how and so you start imagining their dailiness and um that yeah. to me is is the beauty of doing that research not necessarily in writing the wrongs i mean i have no control over what anybody thinks about anything but is i am looking for that connection i think that's why it's fascinating to me mm -hmm. and i have the feeling in a weird way that Ainsley Rance Bufford and i are <laughs> so mates and he doesn't know <laughs> you're like the weird stalker <laughs> looking through his window at night <laughs> from the beyond yes <laughs> oh my gosh so that's what kind of motivates you to continue doing this sort of work. Is that is that feeling? Is that is that the core motivation for you, or what? What's why do you do this? Why do you do this, Cloudy? Wow. <coughs> well, I think it's a. Well, this is a therapy session. Why do I do this? Well, I mean, there one aspect of it is just curiosity. I think I just want to follow there's this thing that's really interesting yeah. i want to understand what that feeling is that's my motivation for a lot of things yeah including this podcast probably oh, yeah. this conversation yeah yeah, yeah yeah no it's that that is what it, it's a big drive right a big motivator because why do we do anything it's because you want to know how it works you want to know what it was like um and i think that's how it starts so yeah, those basic questions. So for instance, if we talk about the, the paper print, it's just as soon as I arrived at the Library of Congress, it was very, very clear that, I mean, I've always known that, right, there was a registration that was earlier than the sneeze, but once you, once I, I got inside, within the first six weeks or so, I wrote in my notebook, um, wow, this really goes hand in hand. The history of the emergence of cinema in the US, the history of intellectual property, but it's also the institutional history of the Library of Congress. And once I started realizing that, that there's this intersection and that I realized, but these documents are created on the inside of this institution. So why don't we know? And that was the big question. And so my curiosity of 
not not only the knowing like i want to know what happened but why don't we know and so those two things have driven that whole journey is it exciting thinking about sharing it with others as well uh, eventually perhaps yeah but i've come so this this is going to be a tangent so earlier this year do you know rick rubin the yeah the music, music producer, producer yeah. so he wrote this book called the creative act which i think has changed my life benji told me that yeah. you recommended oh it to him my God, yeah. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah because i've been professing this to everybody who wants to listen and he's he actually uh, is reading it in mm. one of his um films i've read it twice and i think it's the most profound oh, I need thing to read it. i've ever read it's mm. uh it is deceptively simple the way you read it it's a uh, very short essays and you fly through it like nobody's business and then and then the profoundness of it hits you and also he has a zen like voice so i've been listening to lots of podcasts um also really amazing interviewers and they draw this interesting stuff out of him but so, so sorry to, to to come back to your question is what he says in the, um uh, about the way he creates music is that it is only about you and your self-expression and then once you decide that that is done you can put it out into the world you don't have to uh, but then the journey right is out of your hand and you can't anticipate success i mean this is the the famous thing in in um film as well right you don't know what's going to work um so you cannot put that success or the way that you think you're going to share something or what that is going to do at the beginning of the journey mm. and then say this is going to be my driver you, the driver has to be your self-expression and so that is a new concept to me so to go from outside validation to inside um and it has changed everything for me like on a i think that is a massive distinction between being an artist and working in a creative industry yes is that it goes the other way around in the, in the industry in the industry they ask you what is your target audience before you do anything they right. ask you who is your target audience right. and it always bugged me yeah it felt very creatively inhibitive yeah is that the right phrase? Sure. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think I'm I'm probably more artistic than I ever really right. was allowed to be. I didn't realise that being an academic afforded me to be an artist, so to speak, mm. in, in that environment. Because You're not the first person to say that it's really? a creative endeavour research but yeah. it's 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 relatively new to me the the full the fullness of that realization where i'm like i have found a home here that i really love and of course you know i mean some things don't work but i think that's the same wherever you work but the freedom that it affords me to do these kinds of journeys yes of course there is you know, boxes <laughs> that I need to tick or that, you know, the institution would like me to tick. But, so for instance, take the ref, right? Like it's- You're it's, gonna have to explain that if we're talking about it. Yeah, so the, the <laughs> research excellence frame, this is how the research money gets uh, uh, divided on a national uh, level. The next round is gonna be in five years. So the tension is already building of, we need to create referable outputs. So to me, there is no way of putting that end goal of something has to be whatever, four stars at the beginning of something. So the, the way that I'm trying to apply what I just said to what I'm trying to do is I'm going to write the most creative, best thing that I know right that uh, that that i can do and you're going to trust your instincts in that process and then if it becomes referable 
I mean, this might not be how other academics work. But the, I, th- um, I, I, I think that's the problem. I, I think I've heard some podcasts with Ruben as well, and he, that he says he keeps the execs away from the artists as yes. much as possible because yeah. they have those two different approaches. Right, exactly. And it ruins the artists. And I think maybe just coming back to the thing about Star Wars, like I said, these big franchise blockbuster things, I think that's probably it. That's it's, exactly right. It feels soulless because that's exactly right. They've discussed and strategized beforehand yes. how they're going to make money out of this. What's the target audience? All that yeah, stuff. Yeah, that idea of the existing IP will pay off uh, a, a second time because we've created the audience and they're coming back for more. Yes. which is of course partially true. Yeah. Um, but it's not necessarily something I'm interested in, and I think um, uh, I might have been more black and white before where I would actually t- turn it down now I'm like there is room for all of us um, well this has gotten in a, d- a different <laughs> I way. love it but I it, it's it's <coughs> that book has I I can't describe I need the, to read it what's the, the title the creative act the creative but act. The, the self-title is a way of being so mm. although there are some examples in it that are about music but it's mostly sort of stripped from uh, from that language and it's actually quite general to to apply but there are things in there that I've uh, immediately used with with students so there's a list in there of where he says uh, the following things are not conducive to making uh, the work and whether that is actually creating an output or being in a healthy relationship or you know it, it is really a way of being um, so there are things in there that immediately hit home so for instance before you start a project or a uh, relationship or whatever the you set the bar so high that it actually stifles you to start. Now that is a concept that everybody can recognize no matter how you apply it. Um, There's another one that says, um, everything that is not in your control cannot be in your way. And as so all of these things are retro engineerable for my students because at the beginning of L6, when they're starting to think about their grad projects, I hear versions of these stories, like all the time. This is what they do. Oh, you know, because I cannot make the great, you know, a uh, feature film that I've always wanted to make and I want to get into Sundance with it, but that's not going to happen. So I'm, I'm going, do you see what I mean? Mm. So it's just like that untenable thing mm. that, you know, the outside validation like stops them from even starting Mm -hmm. the the joy of experimentation is gone um and that's what i try to strip out of their stories and it's i'm not saying it's it's always successful but um and then these things that you can't control oh my god it's the biggest the biggest lesson in life Mm. like can i control it can i not then if i can't then no use worrying about it there you go Mm. But my gosh. I think this is probably why you're such an inspirational um, <laughs> teacher for your students. <laughs> um, that reminded me of a podcast I was listening to the other day. Uh, oh, I can never remember the people I'm about to quote. Mm. Neil Gershenfeld, I think his name was. Mm. He works in maybe robotics or something mm-hmm. like this. Um, <clears throat> he said that uh, uh, you, you can think of working on creative pursuits as ready. Uh, people say you should ready, aim, fire in Mm -hmm. the process you should ready yourself prepare you know aim for something Mm -hmm. and then fire but he says instead he said he does ready fire aim oh i like that which is kind of i've i've in in retrospect i've been reflecting on that it's sort of what i'm doing with this podcast i started and it the even from the first episode to this episode things have changed yeah so i'm literally modifying it as i go along rather than stressing about how good i've got a big long list of about 20 things that could improve this podcast Mm -hmm. But it's, now is not the time. It's not ready yeah. yet. Like yeah. I want, ho- hopefully one day to use multiple cameras, for example. Mm. But if I did that right now, it would cause me no end of extra yeah. editing work exactly. and stress. Yeah. So to the point where I probably wouldn't then do the podcast yeah. because yeah, yeah, exactly. it'd be too much. Yeah. So it's it's that sort of idea. You ready, fire, and then you sit down and think about what you've got yeah. and where we can go from here. Kind and of thing. And that is the creative matter, right? Mm. You try, 
and then you reassess reiterate and then you're like what would i do differently you know? mm. so i love that about what we do in l4 with understanding experimental film uh, because that's exactly what we try to teach them um but the funny thing is these students are so conditioned to have this one slick final submission that they honestly don't know what it is to experiment which is exactly what we're asking them to do mm -hmm. and then at the same time what we're also asking is you owe it to yourself to figure out whether this is the way that you like working because if it is not it'll show you you know super invaluable lessons for the rest of your career if you are not a self-starter if you don't have an idea and you want to get up and you want to work on it that probably determines what you're going to do in a film crew mm. right if you if you always like being surrounded by other people if you like being on the set uh, and conversely there are people who discover well this is exactly how I like working um, that might right make you gravitate towards certain roles over over others and it's um, yeah sometimes really shocking that I mean some of them really embraced us uh, and especially, you know, L4 is really important. So this is first year of undergrad? Yes. L4, yeah. Um, so it's really important because they, you know, are in a new environment, they need to pass it. But <laughs> the first year doesn't count towards the classification of their degree. Yeah, but don't, that's problematic in itself, isn't it? And I've always felt this when I'm marking mm -hmm. the concept of marking a film. Yes. At all. Mm-hmm is massively problematic in my mind. How come? Uh, because um, if we are saying that film is art, mm -hmm. then how can you grade art? I mean, I, I guess we have um, assignment uh, criteria, yeah, right? Yeah, so we, we mark against the criteria. But I, I hope it doesn't give students the wrong impression that they're being marked as if it's some judgment of their film in total. In, because yeah. it, it's only literally... a an assessment of the assessment criteria right do you know what i mean yeah absolutely but also i mean there are other there are other things that you use right so for instance there is in, in understanding experimental film they make an artifact and we call it artifact for a reason because it can be something else that is not a film uh but there's also a logbook in which they lay out their process this is also really what i love about our program is that this it's this constant integration of uh, the practical and the and the theoretical right or and the making and the writing um but it's also we see that particularly in the grad project we have intended learning outcomes and whether someone is making an exhibition of film or writing a dissertation they have to they have to adhere to those learning outcomes and at the same time it is the design of a research project which starts with a robust research question a methodology and then hopefully a conclusion and a jumping off point to a future endeavor and irrespective of what you make it still needs to be right uh, a, a research project and in practice for us it turns out that the people who make films have a much harder time designing it as a research project mm -hmm. because they are so caught up in the right all the elements that go into making a film that they kind of forgot that it is underpinned by <laughs> a research question and then it's it's really it, those those conversations are so fascinating because they might look at someone like Christopher Nolan and think, oh, you know, he's only involved with whatever uh, his seventy millimeter camera, but you know, they kind of forget that even big productions <laughs> like that, there's usually some research questions underpinning oh, I see, uh, yeah. the, the, the whole lot. Mm. It's not just like, but I just, because I hear this all the time, but I just want to make things. <laughs> it's so Does that, Is that not contradictory to what we said a moment ago about creative, being creative and experimenting though? Or, or do you think that's oh, no. for outside of the assessment? Bruce? I know, but it's, th that's all one big process. Mm. The, 
you have a you have a question no matter what the research question is and then you go about the process of experimenting but then you need to build in a a, a check moment of what do i think constitutes success in light of that research question mm. and then you reassess you adapt you experiment some more and then you end up at a at a final at a final answer to that research question or you might decide which might also be a part of an experiment in your broader life or the, or the broader degree perhaps yeah. that individual assessment yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. so i think no, it's important I mean, for students to keep that perspective yes. when they get a grade back you know that, that this could just be a stepping stone to figuring something else out do you know what i mean yeah, because yeah. i think um it might be something else rick rubin said actually uh, since you've brought him up um that uh, artists need to have space to fail and to throw mm. out their worst work yeah and feel comfortable to be able to put ideas out there that are ter- I mean, look, terrible at times look, look at your own life i mean aren't the biggest lessons in the things that did not work i mean for me the hardest lessons often yeah for sure but the mm. ones that will stay with you forever mm. and of course there are wonderful highlights and you learn from that too maybe that they can exist but my low points have taught me more than or failures in that in that sense that maybe things that you would never do again or that you have taught you such a I mean, some experiences in life are a true paradigm shift in the way that you are in the world, right? Mm. Yeah. So absolutely. yeah, uh, the room to fail is, but but that, that's also here. It's a very very expensive playground. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I wonder if that changes the dynamic of that. Yeah. Anyway, right. I've been meaning to talk about your book, yeah. and I can't believe we've left it this long. <laughs> <laughs> so, Cloudy yeah. Opton Camp, Doctor Cloudy Opton Camp. Mm. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Mm-hmm. Yeah, good. Um, put this book together. Mm-hmm. Is that fair to say? No, co co edited. Co edited. Mm-hmm. A history of intellectual property and fifty objects. Yes. Um, which I grabbed from our library. So, if anyone uh, students or staff from Bournemouth University are listening. You can get that from the library. And the, at the end of L5, we do a quiz and whoever wins gets a copy. Do they really? Yeah. Oh, that's really, lovely. It's really fun. <laughs> do they go, oh, thanks. No, no, I'm joking, no, no. I'm joking. I mean, usually, <laughs> yeah, no, usually, they, uh, yeah, they love it. It's, it's a fantastic so um, idea and a fantastic book. Um, how did it come about? Um, and also the burning question I want to really ask is, how on earth do you go about getting together? How many contributors are in this? 50. 50 individual contributors. Yeah. One for each chapter, yeah. essentially. One for well, each essay. a couple are double and a couple have two. So in, in the end, I think it is exactly 50. Yeah, I noticed some have double, which yeah. is why I wasn't sure. But um, how do you go about getting all those people to write this thing for you? And do you know them all personally? Uh, are they all contacts of yours? Were they contacts before this? Or did you just start the process of finding these people? How on earth do you go oh about God, doing that? We can do an entire podcast on, <laughs> on this book um so feel free to refer to it if you need to yes, yes, <laughs> so i i responded to a job ad that's how it starts really? um yes okay. uh, and it was at swinburne university in melbourne um i had just finished my phd um i really wanted to continue on this uh, I mean, I was so interested in in copyright and intellectual property, and I saw this ad, and it said uh, it was the most wonderful thing that I had read because it was a postdoctoral fellowship in intellectual property, but who they were looking for, the, the way that was written was really inviting because it even said like you know you could be coming from game studies, and I was like, the person who has written this is has a particular way of. Um, inviting in the openness mm. of bringing bringing in other perspectives. So that that was Dan uh, Hunter, my um, uh, co-editor, um, and I had a. So Dan came from oh Dan oh I see Dan was the one who put the ad out. Yes, I see. And, yep. and uh, he's the foundation dean of uh, the law program at um, uh, Swinburne University. Okay. So I had a conversation with him just before I actually put in the application, and this is what he mentioned he had this idea it had sort of 
um, uh, stagnated for a number of reasons, but whoever he was going to hire was going to work on this book. And that was, I mean, my light bulb, I was like, that has to be me. <laughs> no, because I just, you know what, the way he explained it to me in this conversation, I, I remember this really vividly and I still have, um, you know, I was scribbling down all these nodes while we were having this conversation and I saw it in my head. Like he named the title and I saw it in my head. I was like, this is something I would want to work on. Um, this is a very long process. I mean, this is uh, from that moment until I came out, it was about four years, I want to say. Yeah. No, still, that, and, uh, that seems actually surprisingly short. Actually, yeah. I mean, uh, because from the actual book proposal uh, or, or the contract until finishing was actually, uh, yeah, quite, yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> we worked pretty hard. <laughs> um, but also my role changed over time and it became uh, larger and larger. Um, so there are so many answers to all that, all those questions that you asked. So um, <laughs> uh, Dan obviously um, has, you know, the, the, the majority of these contacts, uh, some of whom are uh, very clearly mine. Uh, then we start, I mean, it's just one big puzzle. Right? So, no, I mean, it's, it, it feels like it's paining you just to think about no, this. No, 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 but it's, it's no, no, well, no, there's, um, there, there is just not one answer to the question because right. it changed like mm. almost on a monthly basis because, right. uh, Let's look at, so there, there's all these different regimes within intellectual property, but we also say it's a history of intellectual property. So there is patents, there are trademarks, there is copyright, and we needed to, uh, you know, were we going to do this chronologically? And, and mm. what are the objects that are going to be in, in this book? And who's going to write it? And so, some of the people we, we didn't know, and we just contacted them. But what I do want to say is, uh, and I think th that was a really good way forward, um, I had created a dummy for just about half of the book of 25 objects of sort of thinking through some of these issues because I can give you an example. So this this material at the beginning of every chapter in which mm. we say what is the what is the bigger color uh, code that it's part of because these color codes are um, periods periods so of time speak. right and then what regime is it patent what country what is the timing so making this visual sort of helped us think through some of the issues that we were going to have to address and how <coughs> were people going to use this book. Because and again, you're sort of looking for milestones, I suppose. Are you like things that have shifted the interpretation of the laws and things like this? Yes and <coughs> no. I mean, yes, but also they just needed to be really good stories. Mm. They needed to be interesting uh, objects. Um, they needed to be objects of which, you know, if you're interested in this book, you go, I had no idea that this not the singer sewing machine that yeah. my mother has in the, in, in the shed. Well, I can give one um, example that really surprised me. It was mm -hmm. Mike Tyson's tattoo towards the end of the book. Yeah. I mean... I love that. Well, I, I, didn't re I haven't read that um, particular yeah. essay yet, but, I mean, the questions that popped into my mind is, who owns the copyright for that? That's, that's exactly right. <laughs> is it a spoiler alert? We don't want to no, give no, away... No, no, no. I mean, I also don't necessarily <coughs> want to thread on, you know, what the individual authors uh, write, because this is also, you know, uh, these are particularly personal interpretations of some of these really um, mm. difficult questions. <coughs> but there is, of course, as you might realize, the um, the, the movie of the, the Hangover that then uses it, and that became a very famous court case of that, that oh. tattoo artist. Oh, and, because, and the, I some, mean, because another actor had it tattooed on their face. Yes. Is that what you mean? And, in then, the thing. Yeah, yeah, right. and then this is sort of a combination of two different styles, but it's also traditional knowledge. I mean, it, the story is incredible. Like, mm. I need to read, read that one later. Yeah. Um, I, read, I read the Barbie one in full because I heard right. you mention that on, on another podcast, yeah. and I thought, okay, I'll have to read that one. Um, and that's really interesting. I, I love the kind of the way it was told as if it's a struggle over... Or, um, Barbie being used as a sex symbol and they, they were basically trying to protect this over time. Uh, the but chaste it's, image, yeah. But then they were always kind of uh, it, 
trying to figure out where on the line they should fall between right. kind of you know enforcing all this stuff but also letting people have creative freedom to allow barbie to become this other thing in the in the public sphere sort of yeah. thing and it mentioned you know um that aqua song barbie girl in it yes. and um <clears throat> and that kind of interpretation of it and the, i think they 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 took out a couple of lawsuits didn't they i think one was against that yeah yeah that the band, whole, the but they were unsuccessful about... on, on both of the major ones the the whole chapter <clears throat> is about uh that particular litigation strategy mm. because i think you know uh barbie in a book like this you could have told five different stories and this is this is one uh, uh particular one so that is part of um you know, so for instance, uh, Dan's research was very much about Mattel and Lego, uh, but also in, in uh, into luxury items. And so that sort of started to shape. That was the very first chapter that was done. Oh, really? And also um, that particular style in which he wrote it, that was sort of the <coughs> driver for uh, Cambridge University Press to go like, oh, I think I think there's a book here, right? Because mm. it was, we have called it sort of a, a well-informed but still popular, right? It, it, it has a, I mean, it's... it's oh, the, only, the subject category it belongs to, you mean, is sort of like... Yeah, like every essay... Appealing to sort, popular... Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> But also, you know, not a not a lot of uh, footnotes. Actually, none, which was which is quite difficult to get lawyers to write without without footnotes. <laughs> um, but what I was trying to say <coughs> earlier is, um, it has remained a big puzzle until uh, the very end. I mean, I can for almost every entry, I can give you like five alternatives that we that we might have discussed. Right, the master list is is huge but it was a lot like oh if that person could do this one then maybe this other person could do that one but if this person is either not available or they don't want to do that uh, that object but they they have a different uh, suggestion then maybe that do you see what I mean mm. and so uh, we did a couple of round tables which were really interesting so I had a dummy for about half of the book and then we invited in three different locations, sort of local uh, people who we would know would be invested in this idea. In, in most cases, we're even going to be part of the book. But um, without opening the dummy, we had it on the table and it was more like, okay, if you see a book with this title and it didn't have this cover yet, <laughs> uh, it actually had the Barbie's legs on the cover, which I've always loved as a, <laughs> as a cover. Um, no, because it's so, you know, her, her hip uh, joint is patented but it's 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 so visually stunning and she mm. stands on her tiptoes yeah. which you know it's all protected <laughs> um so anyway that was on the table and then we were like okay a, a book with a with a title like this what would you expect to definitely be in this book and then we started you know it was really sort of a a, a, a workshop type environment so uh the light bulb always came up mm. um the uh contraceptive pill coca-cola you know there were a couple where you're like you have to have those right. and then but we already had most of the ones that people said <laughs> uh, i think it maybe in one or two cases we changed our minds and go like oh that's a good one or uh, we had these representative categories i want to say and then what we could stick in there was almost uh immaterial in the sense so I, we had these categories of like we need we need to do something with luxury but what is going to be <coughs> the actual thing that be was that because you want debatable. because you want people to understand this thing about yes, and exactly. then and then you figure out which object best yes exactly suits that so that, that happened topic. quite a bit yeah but there there's lots of duos and tandems in there too so for instance Viagra and the, and the pill go hand in hand. But we discussed also, for instance, what would happen if the one gets written by a woman and the other one by a man or vice versa? Would that change the story? So we <laughs> experimented quite a bit with that. Um, I think we each put our own personalities in there in terms of what... I mean, I, I thought... Uh, quite hard for certain media entries. I thought the Zapruder film had to be in there, you know, and that says something about my own interest. You know what I mean? So we are in this uh, uh, book as well. And then 
the main reason why this book is called A History of Intellectual Property mm-hmm. in 50 Objects is that you can... What we were talking about earlier. Yeah, you can make <laughs> you can make three, mm. three more of these volumes with 50 other objects. And you would ask uh, any random professor of IP, maybe some of the objects would be the same, but it's very likely that they wouldn't have chosen these particular 50. Mm. And actually, ever since... Uh, you know, it has come out. There's always examples where I'm like, oh, that would have been good. Well, the Eiffel power. Tower, I don't know when I heard that. Oh. The Eiffel Tower was patent, patented. And I was going to ask you why wasn't the Eiffel Tower included, but I guess you don't have an answer for that. No, I, don't I know mean, if, I there's don't know. so many objects where you go like, yeah. why was that not included? You know, <laughs> so uh, Brian Fry, who's, whose podcast you mentioned, but he wrote the, the entry for the Zapruder film. He liked... He liked the format so much that he used it as a as a contest for his students in the US. And he asked me to be a, a judge for this essay competition. And their ideas were so amazing. Like the, the Tiffany blue box, because that blue color is protected. I mean, it was such a genius. I was like, oh man, that would have been a great one. Uh, the Air Jordan. Mm. Uh, and now with the film oh, coming point, out because yeah. I watched it and I was like oh man that <laughs> yeah yeah that's a big one actually good. yeah <laughs> the thing is also don't forget that most of these objects have uh, I mean lots of other uh, objects have IP stories but these IP stories usually have a twist to it so we can think of many other objects that are uh, you know, iconic or, yeah. uh, patented whatever mm. but What's their story? Exactly, and mm. sometimes there is there is no issue, but mm. Barbie is particularly juicy, right? Coca Cola <laughs> is particularly juicy, and so um, yeah, you you can tell you can tell you know many more volumes like that. So that's why it's not called the history of intellectual. <laughs> no, no, we were very very. Uh, Maybe the next one will have to be the history uh, in. The- 30,000 objects. Oh my god. But the, the funny thing is, is, you know, it plays on a trope and you, you can find yeah, of course, um, yeah. many, yeah. many more like this. And yeah. some actually say the. And then I'm, because I, I looked at, I don't know how many of these, like a lot, and I read the introductions to all of them because I was wondering what they would be flagging up. And but I, that idea of have we set ourselves up for a mission impossible is almost in all of them. Mm. Because what you're trying to do is, you know, again, you, you try to package three hundred years of history into yeah. It could be it could be a sense of uh arrogant slightly to say V as well I mean I actually I'm done also I don't think it's possible you can't say this is the history of <laughs> yeah. IP yeah but in terms of marketing I think it doesn't yeah. matter either way But because I am done yeah. for this podcast it's called An Idiot's Guide to Academic Re- rather than yes. V yes but ultimately, I wonder if the would be better because it 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 jumps out at people. Oh, it's that's the one. That's you know. That's but that's it. also you know the book uh, the book series of the idiot's guide to. Yeah. Oh, true. So I could be in, yeah, yeah could be in a spot of bother if I'd use that. Oh no no that's not what I meant. <laughs> Is that what you meant? Oh. No, but I mean it. Uh, you can then use the <laughs> recognizability of of that expression. Oh, I see. Right? You don't think I'd get in trouble with intellectual no, property? No, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. You're the person to ask. Well, no, I also think that in art and education everything should be allowed so don't quote me on any of it no that's, and it was just um, it was just really wonderful to work on this uh, uh, some people i still haven't met um sometimes i'm at events or conferences where i see your name like this on a and i have a great reason to go over and it's just so fun to introduce yourself to someone who wouldn't it be great to have an exhibition of this yeah has that been considered uh well we had a we had an event at a conference in Rome just before it came out where we we were in the position of having 20 authors uh, in the same spot and then we did like a big presentation and and a book launch so that was really really fun um but I yeah. suppose it would be almost impossible to get all 50 together at once yes <laughs> and also you know some of these uh, some of these objects are um either too large or non-existent some some are unique so, for instance, there's a Tempesta map of Rome. There's only, uh, you know, a, a few iterations of those. Right. Um, I mean, yeah, it's... 
And I, it, it, it's still so interesting to see now many years later how people are using it and they keep telling me stories about how they're using it or what, what they would put in the book and yeah, so it, it keeps it keeps growing. It's fantastic. It's a wonderful idea. I think it also achieves something that I may be slightly aiming to achieve with this podcast, which is making the kind of intangible more tangible. So I'm trying to sort of break down barriers to the idea of academic research. Right. You've managed to successfully kind of condense the idea of intellectual property right. into something, as you say, that is... such a scary term, right? I mean, I mean yeah. Like... I mean, this has opened my eyes completely to just how ubiquitous mm. the idea of intellectual property yeah. is. Oh, that's what I was going to ask you, actually. How, what, mm. how do you think life would be different today if we didn't have these these laws and this system in place how would it change the way we do things there's a wonderful book you know those oxford very short introduction to mm. uh, so there's one for intellectual property and it's written by um i'm gonna butcher his name siva vaidyanathan who's a um, communication scholar at i believe nyu and he's written um the the very short introduction to intellectual property i actually use it for teaching because it is um the clearest, most accessible kind of language to to lay out, uh, you know, the relatively short history, but also the importance. And he does, uh, the introduction is entirely hung up um, on the example of Starbucks, like all the regimes of the intellectual property system come together in Starbucks and actually maybe a Starbucks cup would would have been had <laughs> I had I read that book first then maybe maybe a Starbucks <laughs> cup would be in there no because it's uh, it's it's so ubiquitous and even to the design of every Starbucks um, you know it's the trade dress and uh, all of it all of it um, but what I'm trying to say is that he in this book tries to imagine the world uh, like what if the protection was stronger but what if it would not exist and he describes it in such uh, great ways I would I wouldn't even be able to um, you know try to do it in my own way but he talks about um, I wonder how it would affect the economy, for example, and you know, businesses and oh, it's just, corporations I mean, becoming. Intellectual as... property underpins, you know, trillions of international uh, uh, trade, right? I mean, it 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 would have a huge effect. I mean, it'd be very confusing to know what product you're picking up for sure. If that's, <laughs> if that's... everyone, because everyone would obviously just copy the the biggest thing, right? Well, you're talking uh, maybe about how, a book and a film, but he's talking yeah. in the book about what if you don't know whether something is going to poison you or is actually yeah, the, food for, yeah, drinking. Yeah, or a, a, a medicine. Mm. Medicine and IEP, right? It's, mm. it's, it's, it's probably the, one of the biggest uh, subcategories that maybe on a daily basis we don't think about that that's regulated by IP. But I just can't imagine our, our sort of capitalist thing would have, would have gone in this manner if we didn't have IP from the start, if that makes sense. I can't imagine there being big brands or anything. I'd, it's very it, hard to it imagine, isn't just, it? Yeah, and, and, and you can even say, you know, I mean, we wouldn't have an iPhone in our pocket without IP. The mm. internet wouldn't exist. You know, we wouldn't have brands like Sony and, you know, whatever. Um, no, it's, yeah, it's under, it underpins everything. But it, um, it plays such a big role in our daily lives, but most people don't realize that that's, that yeah, that's the case. And that, that was the whole... That was the whole angle into into the book, and I think there um, I wasn't part of it then yet, but there was an earlier iteration of this idea where it was uh, IP in the home, and so it was divided into maybe sort of the rooms of of the the house, right? Like a trip trap chair for a baby. That's <laughs> it's all uh, mm. it's all IP, and um, that idea then didn't sort of um you know come to full fruition but it it sort of turned into turn into this <laughs> and i mean how many ip pat am i i hope i'm using the right terminology intellectual property patents are there that go into the iphone for example must be thousands yeah i think uh, small pieces but that it's, all, it's all of point. those regimes it's mm. uh yeah it's copyright it's patent it's the design all of it i wouldn't even dare to put a number on it but yeah it's probably no, it's probably in the thousands, yeah. Mm. Fantastic. So check out um, Cloudy's book if you're interested. Yay. Probably available at all good bookstores. 
Do we yeah, still say well, that these I'm days? Not, I don't know. Online, oh, yeah. My God. I have actually never seen it in, in an actual shop. That would be that would be fun. <laughs> we, think, well, we uh, need to change that. <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, you can buy it from, you know, Amazon and where have you. Other providers are available. Um, you have some pictures, right? Oh, yeah. So we go for them? Yes. And then we'll wrap up. Which one do you want to see first? Um, I don't mind. It's up to you. Okay. Oh, well, the funny thing is, you asked me to bring a picture, and then I just... Um, Cloudy didn't read the brief properly, if any students well, are watching you just, it. Well, <laughs> you, you just said bring a picture. I'm sure I said to blue tack on the wall. Yeah, to blue, I mean, <laughs> technically, you could blue tack it, but what you meant was that you wanted to keep it. Yes, look, yeah. I thought temporarily for <laughs> yeah. the run. But we'll take, we'll take a photo of it or something, and yes. then print it and put it on the wall. Wow, what is that? So this is actually in my apartment. So I just left it up and brought it in the bus. <laughs> we could try blue tacking. I think it would pull the posters down. Yes. No, you can um, maybe take a picture of it. Yeah. So you said bring something that represents your research. And so I sort of looked over and I was like, that image does represent my research. So this is a still from an abstract animation for by Len Lai, who was a New Zealand filmmaker. Mm. And when I first saw this film, it blew my mind. It's from a film called Swinging the Lambeth Walk. And now I'm blanking on the year, but I want to say maybe 1939. Um, it's set to uh, uh, amazing music and it's abstract animation and this dances. I mean, it's it's incredible. So what Lan Lai did is he took the so-called virgin uh, celluloid and then drew on it. But as you might know, right, a 35 millimeter frame has four perforations and uh, a frame line. But what he uses is a, is a completely blank uh, film strip and he draws on it. But the <laughs> mathematical foresight almost that he must have had to understand how this was going to move once it runs through a projector is, I mean, every time I watch it, I find it mind blowing. Was it running at twenty four frames per second? Yes. In, in the so it's a, it's a sound. It's a sound. And, and it and it gives the it gives the impression of continuity of movement like oh a normal film God. would, right? I mean, you should you should watch it. I mean, these stars and the and the little balls they explode and they dance. Really? I mean, it's so beautiful. And he's done that presumably. I mean, you know, I've seen that animation method where they they lay the previous frame underneath and then sort of trace slightly to one side to yeah. show movement of a character. He I, wasn't doing that. He was just doing it on a yeah, strip. Yeah, I think he was doing it on the strip. But it also... That's I, phenomenal. I, I actually should have probably looked into these details, but I think it took something like three years to make. And at the time, the GPO in, in this country, they commissioned this kind of work, right? It was an ad to like post early for Christmas. They had these amazing international uh, uh, abstract animators and, and experimental filmmakers make these ads to post early. So first you see like two, three minutes and the, the some of his other work as well so you see you see this incredibly gorgeous work and then at the end it goes like bling 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 oh post early for christmas <laughs> you realize you've been watching what's gpo this. the post uh, yeah post i think thing. that's what it stands for right oh i don't the know what, i've never heard of the gp the g bit po i guess is post office yeah I but i think it was for. at the time of uh, the mail oh i'm blanking on the acronym but yeah <laughs> that's what it was, but it was something with um the <clears throat> It doesn't matter. <laughs> no, but it kind of does. No so it's an advert today. for the post office, the sort of Royal Mail oh, but it was of the time or whatever commissioned, it was. Um, and here are these masterminds, you know, making this incredible material. But anyway, this uh, irrespective of... Th this one, I think, wasn't for the for the posting early. It doesn't matter. The, the film is gorgeous, and I saw it on a big screen. But what it represents for me is not only the handicraft of how you know the the dailiness of working on this thing for three years and then seeing it move but it represents sort of the um the incredibly privileged world on the inside of the archive because when i was at the netherlands film museum this is actually a still from the print that they had um because we had i had a colleague who 
whose job was uh, alongside other things that he did, but he would make stills for the sales department because these would be used for uh, sales, but also, you know, if you write a book and you need stills in, in the old days, so to speak, you would have to ask like whether they could make a still for you for your book, right? So that was a service <laughs> that, uh, that was provided, but it, it took like lots of steps and this is an actual slide Right, a 35 millimeter slide. He had like this particular setup with which he made slides from these <laughs> films. But what was so incredible about working there is that I had this opportunity of looking at this print and looking at how it was made. Um, and I think what it represents for me now is not only do I think this is a gorgeous still and the colors and all of that, but it's. I think all my research deals with not only that creative reuse um, of existing material, but also the the discrepancies between that privileged inside of the archive and then being outside of it, and then looking at factors that influence access to archival collections and realizing that on the outside, we only see a very, very small percentage of what's inside an art life. and whether that's film or, uh, you know, Library of Congress. So that to me, I mean, I might be reading more into it than it actually Well, and I was just be, thinking it's fascinating that an abstract image can mean so much to an individual, I suppose. Yeah. And it's down to the individual to have that. But that's amazing that well, first it does, of all, it evokes all of those for, thoughts and feelings for you. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, I, I thought it was a beautiful film. Now you can just click on YouTube and find it and watch it. But um, 20, 25 years ago, that definitely wasn't the case. Mm. And so there is, a, there is a real distinction between what you can do on the inside of, a, of an archive when you have all this beautiful material <coughs> at your disposal versus... Uh, outside and that that represents for me you know found footage filmmaking through the use of an archive which is very different from when you try to do that outside of an archive so that's when copyright exceptions come into the story which is what we try to teach our uh, second year students um but also a huge barrier between the archive and the outside world is copyright and so yeah, that inside versus outside is very much, and you know, what are the stories that you can tell? What are the stories that you are allowed to tell? It's all that bigger. I think those are all my themes and uh, yeah. This seems to tie them all together. I think so. <laughs> also, I'm a, I'm a ultra minimalist, so this is about the only thing I have in my house. So well, thank, I was thanks, like, I'll take this one. Thanks for bringing it in. You're going to have a, you're going to have a gap on your wall now when you, since, since you're <laughs> yeah, leaving exactly. this with me. No, I'm joking. Exactly. Uh, you have another image, sorry. Right? Yeah, this is this is funny. So I've been in touch with uh, the lovely Frank, who has retired from the U.S. Copyright Office a long time ago, but who was so instrumental in my research. Um, and he had, do you know what stereo photographs are? So it's one card that's about this big and it has two square photographs, but you, the same ones, uh, practically the same ones, but you put this into a device, which is about this far from your nose and you look to, you look through two little lenses almost and you see then in stereo. That was like a typical. So like a 3D, three dimensional yeah, effect. Yeah. Okay. But it's almost, I mean, that was, a, that, that was an entertainment form at the beginning of uh, the previous century. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's still a, I mean, this VR tech is sort of doing that thing now, isn't it? Oh, with, yeah, absolutely. With these goggles yeah, you no, wear and stuff. Nothing is ever new. <laughs> yeah. No, How no. long ago was that then? That was the uh, thing. This is about uh, 18, we have... 18? Yeah, something? we have, uh, we wow. have examples from 1860, 87. <laughs> wow. So you've seen the shadow line, right? Yeah. So there's lots of stereo photographs in that. Right, so yeah. you see the the colored mm. the colored um sort of boundary and then there's two pictures and then they're the same but i decided to use so many things of the library of congress so, so there's lots of stereo photographs in the in the film not being used in the way that you would use a card but uh, the way they are flat <coughs> are they captured with cameras side by side i think they're captured um 
maybe what what is is it ten percent your eyes diverge ten percent okay so if you take ten percent at that distance or whatever i guess it's a distance thing as well yeah there is a i think the focal length and Mm. then um if if you if you take it ten percent different then you have the perfect alignment with something like that so so it's something that's done in post essentially to make that ten percent or i am not entirely sure maybe it is actually two slightly different photographs Mm. I'm I don't know. Sure how, I don't even know how they do that, that today, to be honest, with VR headsets. Whether they have two cameras side by I side. I think or... sometimes it is actually two sources. Some sometimes it's one source. Oh, I right, think. Okay. I think we have both of those examples. I might be wrong. Anyway, your photo. So what anyway, is this? So he bought um, from an auction or either on eBay or something. Uh, he bought these stereo photographs from when the Library of Congress was still in the Capitol. And. I think this is his neighbor taking a photograph of one of those photographs in this area. But what you see here is Ainsworth Rance Bufford behind his desk in the Capitol as a young man. So do you see him in the back? Mm. He has like the slick hair. Um, but what? So this is the man you've been stalking all this time? Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know if the camera will pick that up. But would uh, would I use those kind of photographs for? So when I was at the Kluge book stacked up in the back as well. Yes, but um, I'll, I'll I'll tell you a couple more things about this photograph. So um, when I was at the Kluge Center, I had a couple of these things printed out in front of me in my cubicle, because I find that staring at these photographs for a very long time, every time you see more. Uh, and not necessarily, yeah, maybe it's the details, but it's also staring at them where you go like, and I put that in the film as well. So I was reading the transcript of a congressional hearing in which he's asked to describe his day. And through something that is in the transcript, I then look over at the photograph and go like, oh my God, there are no lamps, right? There was only daylight. Mm. So when it gets dark, they have to stop working, (laughs) right? Because with those books, I'm sure they're not using candles, for instance. So the longer you look at this kind of evidence, the more you see. So (laughs) what I would like to point out are two things. So there's this thing in front of him on the ground, which Mm. looks like a little cup. Yeah, I thought it was a dog bowl or something. No, so it's called a cuspidor. And this is what you used to spit in because men would chew tobacco. Tobacco. So that's the thing. So to me... There's one one by this chap's chair, I think, as well. Right, right, right. So this opens up a world of imagination for me because I had... I mean, maybe I'd seen it as well in another photograph, not really knowing what it is, maybe indeed thinking it's a dog bowl. I don't know what I (laughs) thought it was. But maybe, you know, you see so many other things and you go like, so that for me would be a point to start a story. Mm. Right? We don't do that anymore. You did that differently. We had smoking, then we banned smoking. Now we have vaping. Do you see how <laughs> that immediately becomes a thread to tell I see. a story? To modern for modern people's through modern people's perspective. But also to try to understand what would that have been like? People mm. spitting in a public cup. To us it's almost unimaginable, it. but it must have been so normal back then that right. people but also what would that have smelled like? Mm. You go to the library, arguably, to maybe read there in silence. And, Ooh, and I can some imagine of some of the spit and... was sort of around right, the bowl. Right. Well. I mean, all <laughs> sorts of things that this conscious of. But the other thing that Frank then pointed out to me, yeah. look at him. So what, what he is trying to do is he has elongated his desk on both sides mm. to barricade anyone from coming in and all the copyright it's sort of like planks of wood going across yes. and so all the copyright deposits are behind him right so he's saying effectively i don't want anybody to touch this stuff i am barricading you physically from what i am doing here and he was also very known for 
um, if someone would, because he was the Librarian of Congress, people would ask him questions all day long. So I'm assuming someone is standing at his desk and he describes this tactic for making people go away. And that's apparently by keeping your uh, your, your gaze down, which is he, which is what he's doing. Although he must realize that the photographer's up there, right? Um, <laughs> and then he quickly answers the question, but he said, if you don't make eye contact, they'll go away quicker than you know they would they would because he just wanted to get on with his work. So to me, uh, I don't know by seeing it, I have the feeling I'm. I'm understanding him better. Mm. Like he was, he was taking his work very seriously. And then, so when I make all these other judgments about what might have happened all these years later, when, because the paper prints that we're talking about, that happens here, that happens in this room. They mm. weren't in the Library of Congress yet, as we now know it, they were still in the Capitol. So why this photograph is important to me is I use that to get sort of this deeper understanding or sense of the place to imagine then everything else happening. And just seeing that kind of stuff, like what would it take for you to barricade your desk <laughs> and then hide all the stuff behind it so that no one would be allowed in there? It's almost like, <clears throat> like the kit desk. You're not allowed I, behind it. Well, there is a little bit of that. In the kit yeah. desk. <laughs> I, I guess um, maybe it alludes a little bit to the working conditions and that people, I don't know, the people who were, who were working with couldn't be trusted not to touch it if he didn't barricade. Perhaps some of them had gone and looked at some stuff and it annoyed him, so that which led to him doing that. Taking it away that. and their yeah. copyright deposits, right? So mm. he's like, you know, I need to, but, but maybe, maybe it's a backlog. Maybe it still needs to be put in the book. You know, it could be anything. <laughs> But it's just... Um, it's fascinating. Looking at this stuff... Anyway, and then someone pointed out, you know, what about this painting? And we, we kind of mm. now know where that painting is or walking around here. What what would it have sounded like? What did it smell like? <laughs> anyway. So much richness in there. Yeah, but I mean, it, it, it helps with imagining that kind of dailiness because like we said earlier, we say a little too easily... Thomas Edison invented motion pictures, mm. right? And that's, of course, that needs unpacking in all sorts of directions. Um, <laughs> and this is a way of to help imagining, I don't know, these, these kind of power structures, I think. And it's helpful to me. It's fantastic. Thank you for bringing yeah. them in. Yeah. <coughs> I well, guess I can't put I that one on the wall either. Here. Huh? I guess I can't put that one on the wall no, either. No, let's take pictures of them. And then I'll have to take photos of them both. Then... I'll do that afterwards. Yeah, no, I need I need my <coughs> Spofford on the wall. I need to <laughs> look at him some more. Anyway. Should we wrap this up? Yeah. Thank you so much for the conversation. For so um, yeah, thank you. Do you know, history was probably my worst subject at school behind Latin. I went to a grammar school, so we oh, did wow. Latin at, at school, and I was terrible at both of them. But, I did. But, some, but somehow you uh, you make history seem really interesting for me. <laughs> oh, that's so and, fun. Uh, and, you? you know, rich and characterful, and it oh. makes me perhaps reconsider myself <laughs> as <laughs> hating history. Full of people. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? I think there's also, we've changed so many things about how we learn things, right? Because mm. I remember the few years that I did take history, it was a matter of, you had to learn all dates these and facts. Hard. I mean, yeah, I, had... I think that's what turned me away. I think yeah, it needs course. it needs to be full of characters. It needs to be about the stories of the people. I think to engage, of course, engage students prob but probably also, from my perspective anyway. I think we need to focus on what is it, what does that mean for you here and now? Mm. That's what history is about, right? It's always told through the vantage point of the present, right? And I think. That's, again, something else I hadn't considered until this conversation, to be honest. So um, thank you for that as yeah, well. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's the biggest thing. My PhD uh, supervisor, you know, I think said this on a, on a daily basis. And it's it's so incredibly powerful because I think I've, I've thoroughly been schooled as this is what happened. And then you realize, well, it's... It's the storytelling of that story that we need to not necessarily mistrust, but think question. about a li yeah, question and, mm. and think about a little bit more than um, 
Yeah, just assuming that that is what happened. I think that's a lovely note to leave it on. Dr. Cloudy Opton Camp, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. Um, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, good luck with all your future endeavours. Thanks. You too. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we finished now. Bye. <laughs>